This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 11b. Never would Richie forget that night, as long as he lived, never, in the gods of the old royal with little peak, and when the first note. Speech paused on Richie's lips. Coming out with a whopper now, rhapsodies about damn all, believes his own lies, does really, wonderful liar, but want a good memory. Which air is that? asked Leopold Bloom. All is lost now. Richie cocked his lips a pout. A low, incipient note, sweet banshee murmured, All. A thrush, a throstle, his breath, bird sweet, good teeth he's proud of, fluted with plaintive woe, is lost. Rich sound, two notes in one there, blackbird I heard in the Hawthorne Valley. Taking my motives, he twined and turned them. Almost too new call is lost in all. Echo. How sweet the answer! How is that done? All lost now. Mournful he whistled. Fall, surrender, lost. Bloom bent Leopold ear, turning a fringe of doily down under the vase. Order. Yes, I remember. Lovely air. In sleep she went to him. Innocence in the moon. Brave. Don't know their danger. Still hold her back. Call name. Touch water. Jingle jaunty. Too late. She longed to go. That's why. Woman. As easy stop the sea. Yes, all is lost. A beautiful air, said Bloom, lost Leopold. I know it well. Never in all his life had Richie Goulding. He knows it well, too, or he feels, still harping on his daughter. Wise child that knows her father, Daedalus said. Me? Bloom askance over liverless saw. Face of the all is lost, rollicking Richie once, jokes old stale now wagging his ear, napkin-ring in his eye, now begging letters he sends his son with. Cross-eyed Walter, sir, I did, sir. Wouldn't trouble, only was I expecting some money. Wouldn't trouble, only I was expecting some money. Apologize. Piano again. Sounds better than last time I heard. Tuned, probably. Stopped again. Dollard and Cowley still urged the lingering singer out with it. With it, Simon, it, Simon. Ladies and gentlemen, I am most deeply obliged by your kind solicitations. It, Simon. I have no money, but if you will lend me your attention, I shall endeavor to sing to you of a heart bowed down. By the sandwich bell in screening shadow, Lydia, her bronze and rose, a lady's grace, gave and withheld. As in cool Glaucus Odenil, Mina, two tankards to her pinnacles of gold. The harping chords of prelude closed. A chord, long drawn, expectant, drew a voice away. When first I saw that form endearing. Richie turned. See Daedalus's voice, he said. Brain-tipped, cheek-touched with flame, they listened, feeling that flow, endearing flow over skin, limbs, human heart, soul, spine. Bloom signed to Pat, bald Pat, is a waiter hard of hearing, to set ajar the door of the bar. The door of the bar. So, that will do. Pat, waiter, waited, waiting to hear, for he was hard of hear by the door. Sorrow from me seemed to depart. Through the hush of air a voice sang to them, low, not rain, not leaves in murmur, like no voice of strings or reeds, or what do you call them dulcimers, touching their still ears with words, still hearts of their each his remembered lives. Good, good to hear, 
sorrow from them each seemed to from both depart when first they heard. When first they saw, lost Richie Poldy, mercy of beauty, heard from a person wouldn't expect it in the least, her first merciful love-soft, oft-loved word. Love that is singing, love's old sweet song. Bloom unwound slowly the elastic band of his packet. Love's old sweet sonne la gold. Bloom wound a skein round four fork fingers, stretched it, relaxed, and wound it round his troubled double fourfold in octave gived them fast. Full of hope, and all delighted. Tenors get women by the score, increase their flow, throw flower at his feet. When will we meet? My head it simply jingle all delighted. He can't sing for tall hats. Your head it simply swirls, perfumed for him. What perfume does your wife? I want to know. Jing, stop, knock. Last look at mirror always before she answers the door. The hall. There. How do you? I do well. There. What? Or? File of cautious, kissing comfits in her satchel. Yes. Hands felt for the opulent. Alas, the voice rose, sighing, changed, loud, full, shining, proud. But, alas, t'was idle dreaming. Glorious tone he has still, cork air softer also their brogue. Silly man, could have made oceans of money, singing wrong words. Wore out his wife, now sings. But hard to tell. Only the two themselves, if he doesn't break down. Keep a trot for the avenue. His hands and feet sing, too. Drink, nerves overstrung. Must be abstemious to sing. Jenny Lind soup, stock, sage, raw eggs, half pint of cream. For creamy dreamy. Tenderness it welled, slow, swelling, full it throbbed. That's the chat. Ha! Give, take, throb, a throb, a pulsing, proud, erect. Words? Music? No, it's what's behind. Bloom looped, unlooped, nodded, disnodded. Bloom, flood of warm jam-jam, lick it up secretness, flowed to flow in music out, in desire, dark to lick flow invading, tipping her, tepping her, tapping her, topping her, tup, pours to dilate, dilating, tup, the joy, the feel, the warm, the to pour o'er sluices, pouring gushes, flood, gush, flow, joy gush, tup throb, now language of love. Ray of hope is beaming. Lydia for Lidwell squeak scarcely here so ladylike the muse unsqueaked a ray of hope. Martha it is. Coincidence. Just going to write. Lionel song. Lovely name you have. Can't write. Except my little prez. Play on her heart-strings, purse-strings, too. She's a... I called you naughty boy. Still the name. Martha. How strange. Today. The voice of Lionel returned, weaker but unwearied. It sang again to Richie, Poldy, Lydia, Lidwell. Also sang to Pat, open-mouth, ear, waiting to wait. How first he saw that form endearing. How sorrow seemed to part. How look, form, word charmed him. Gould Lidwell, won Pat Bloom's heart. Wish I could see his face, though. Explain better. Why the barber in Drago's always looked my face when I spoke his face in the glass. Still hear it better here than in the bar, though farther. Each graceful look. First night when first I saw her at Matt Dillon's in Terenure. Yellow, black lace she wore. Musical chairs, we two the last, fate, after her, fate. Round and round, slow, quick round, we two all looked, halt. Down she sat, all ousted looked, lips laughing, yellow knees. Charmed my eye. Singing, waiting, she sang. I turned her music, full voice of perfume, of what perfume does your lilac trees. Bosom I saw, both full, throat warbling. First I saw. She thanked me. Why did she me, fate? Spanishy eyes. 
Under a pear tree, alone patio this hour in old Madrid, one side in shadow, Dolores, she Dolores, at me, luring, ah, alluring. Martha, ah, Martha. Quitting all languor, Lionel cried in grief, in cry of passion dominant to love to return with deepening yet with rising chords of harmony. In cry of Lionel loneliness, that she should know, must Martha feel. For only her he waited, where, here, there, try there, here, all try where, somewhere. Come, thou lost one, come, thou dear one. Alone, one love, one hope, one comfort me. Martha, chestnote, return. Come. It soared, a bird, it held its flight, a swift, pure cry. Soar silver orb, it leaped serene, speeding, sustained, to come. Don't spin it out too long, long breath, he breath, long life. Soaring high, high resplendent, a flame, crowned, high in the effulgence symbol symbolistic, high of the ethereal bosom, high of the high vast irradiation everywhere, all soaring all around about the all, the endlessnessnessness. To me, Siopold, consumed, come, well sung, all clapped, she ought to, come, to me, to him, to her, you too, me, us, bravo, clap, clap, good man, Simon, clappy, clap, clap, encore, clap, clip, clap, clap, sound as a bell, bravo, Simon, clap, 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 encore, on clap, said, cried, clapped all, Ben Dollard, Lydia Deuce, George Lidwell, Pat, Mina Kennedy, two gentlemen with two tankards, Cowley, first gent with tank and bronze Miss Deuce and gold Miss Mina. Blazes Boylan's smart tan shoes creaked on the bar floor, said before. Jingle by monuments of Sir John Gray, Horatio one-handled Nelson, Reverend Father Theobald Matthew, jaunted, as said before just now. A trot in heat, heat-seated. Cloche, sonela, cloche, sonela. Slower the mare went up the hill by the rotunda, Rutland Square. Too slow for Boylan, blazes Boylan, impatience Boylan, joggled the mare. An after-clang of Cowley's cords closed, died on the air made richer. And Richie Goulding drank his power, and Leopold Bloom his cider drank, Lidwell his Guinness, second gentleman said they would partake of two more tankards, if she did not mind. Miss Kennedy smirked, disserving, coral lips at first at second. She did not mind. Seven days in jail, Ben Dollard said, on bread and water, then you'd sing Simon like a garden thrush. Lionel Simon, singer, laughed. Father Bob Cowley played. Mina Kennedy served. Second gentleman paid. Tom Kernan strutted in. Lydia admired, admired. But Bloom sang dumb. Admiring. Ritchie, admiring, descanted on that man's glorious voice. He remembered one night long ago. Never forget that night. She sang. T'was rank and fame. In Ned Lambert's t'was. Good God, he never heard in all his life a note like that he never did, then, false one, we had better part so clear, so God, he never heard since love lives, not a clinking voice lives, not ask Lambert, he can tell you, too. Goulding, a flush, struggling in his pale, told Mr. Bloom, face of the night, see in Ned Lambert's, Dedalus house, sang, t'was rank and fame. He, Mr. Bloom, listened while he, Richie Goulding, told him, "'Twas Mr. Bloom." He, Mr. Bloom, listened while he, Richie Goulding, told him, Mr. Bloom, of the night he, Richie, heard him, see Dedalus, sing, "'Twas rank and fame in his, Ned Lambert's house." Brothers-in-law, relations, we never speak as we pass by. Rift in the lute, I think, treats him with scorn, see, he admires him all the more. The night he sang. The night she sang. The human voice, two tiny silky chords, wonderful more than all others. That voice was a lamentation. Calmer now. 
It's in the silence after you feel you hear. Vibrations. Now silent air. Bloom ungived his crisscrossed hands and with slack fingers plucked the slender catgut thong. He drew and plucked. It buzzed, it twanged. While Goulding talked of Barraclough's voice production, while Tom Carnan, harking back in a retrospective sort of arrangement, talked to listening Father Cowley, who played a voluntary, who nodded as he played. While Big Ben Dollard talked with Simon Dedalus, lighting, who nodded as he smoked, who smoked. Thou lost one. All songs on that theme. Yet more bloom stretched his string. Cruel, it seems. Let people get fond of each other, lure them on, then tear asunder. Death, explose, knock on the head. Out a hell of that. Human life. Dignam. Ugh, that rat's tail wriggling. Five bob I gave. Corpus paradisum. Corn-cake croaker. Belly like a poisoned pup. Gone. They sing. Forgotten. I, too, and one day she with. Leave her. Get tired. Suffer then. Snivel. Big Spanishy eyes, goggling at nothing, her wavy, avy, heavy, 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 yeevy, heavy hair uncombed. Yet too much happy bores. He stretched more, more. Are you not happy in your— Twang! It snapped. Jingle into Dorset Street. Miss Deuce withdrew her satiny arm, reproachful, pleased. Don't make half so free, said she, till we are better acquainted. George Lidwell told her really and truly, but she did not believe. First gentleman told Mina that was so. She asked him was that so, and second tanker told her so, that that was so. Miss Deuce, Miss Lydia, did not believe. Miss Kennedy, Mina, did not believe. George Lidwell, no. Miss Dew did not. The first, the first, gent with the tank, believe, no, no, did not, Miss Ken. Lid Lydia well, the tank. Better write it here. Quills in the post office chewed and twisted. Bald Pat at a sign drew nigh. A pen and ink, he went. A pad, he went. A pad to blot. He heard, deaf Pat. Yes, Mr. Bloom said, teasing the curling catgut line. It certainly is. Few lines will do. My present. All that Italian florid music is. Who this wrote? Know the name you know better. Take out sheet, note-paper, envelope, unconcerned. It's so characteristic. Grandest number in the whole opera, Goulding said. It is, Bloom said. Numbers it is. All music, when you come to think. Two multiplied by two divided by half is twice one. Vibrations. Chords those are. One plus two plus six is seven. Do anything you like with figures juggling. Always find out this equal to that. Symmetry under a cemetery wall. He doesn't see my mourning. Callous, all for his own gut. Muse mathematics. And you think you're listening to the ethereal, but suppose you said it like, Martha, seven times nine minus x is thirty-five thousand. Fall quite flat. It's on account of the sounds it is. Instance he's playing now, improvising. Might be what you like, till you hear the words. Want to listen sharp, hard. Begin all right, then hear chords a bit off. Feel lost a bit. In and out of sacks, over barrels, through wire fences, obstacle race. Time makes the tune. Question of mood you're in. Still always nice to hear. Except scales up and down, girls learning. Two together next-door neighbors. Ought to invent dummy pianos for that. Blumenlied I bought for her, the name. Playing it slow, a girl, night I came home, the girl. Door of the stables near Cecilia Street, Milly no taste. Queer, because we both, I mean. Bald deaf Pat brought quite flat pad ink. Pat set with ink pen quite flat pad. Pat took plate dish knife fork. Pat went. It was the only language Mr. Dedalus said to Ben. He heard them as a boy in Ringabella, Crosshaven, Ringabella singing their barcarolles. Queenstown Harbour full of Italian ships. Walking, you know, Ben, in the moonlight with those earthquake hats. Blending their voices. 
God, such music, Ben, heard as a boy, cross Ringabella Haven Mooncarol. Sour pipe removed, he held a shield of hand beside his lips that cooed a moonlight night call, clear from a near, a call from afar, replying. Down the edge of his free man baton ranged blooms, your other eye, scanning for where did I see that? Callan, Coleman, Dignam, Patrick, hey ho, hey ho, Fawcett, aha, just I was looking. Hope he's not looking, cute as a rat. He held unfurled his freeman. Can't see now. Remember, write Greek S. Bloom dipped. Blue mur. Dear sir. Dear Henry wrote. Dear Maddy. Got your let and flow. Hell did I put. Some pock or of. It is utter impos. Underline impos. To write today. Bore this. Bored Bloom tambourined gently with I am just reflecting fingers on flat pad pat brought. On. Know what I mean. No, change that E. Accept my poor lit prez and close. Ask her no ants. Hold on. Five dig. Two about here. Penny the gulls. Elijah is come. Seven Davy Burns. Eight is about. Say half a crown. My poor little prez. P. O. Two and six. Write me along. Do you despise? Jingle, have you the— So excited. Why do you call me naught? You naughty too? Oh, Myrie lost the string of her. Bye for today. Yes, yes, we'll tell you. Want to, to keep it up. Call me that other, other world, she wrote. My patience are exhaust. To keep it up, you must believe, believe, the tank, it, is, true. Folly am I writing? Husbands don't. That's marriage does, their wives. Because I'm away from, suppose, but how, she must, keep young. If she found out. Card in my high grade, ha! No, not tell all. Useless pain, if they don't see. Woman. Sauce for the gander. A hackney car, number 324, driver Barton James of number 1 Harmony Avenue, Donnybrook, on which sat a fair, a young gentleman, stylishly dressed, in an indigo-blue serge suit made by George, Robert, Messias, tailor and cutter, of No. 5 Eden K., and wearing a straw hat, very dressy, bought of John Plasto of No. 1 Great Brunswick Street, Hatter. Eh? This is the jingle that joggled and jingled. By Dlucad's pork-shop bright tubes of Agendath trotted a gallant buttocked mare. Answering an ad? Keen Richie's eyes asked Bloom. Yes, Mr. Bloom said, town traveller, nothing doing, I expect. Bloom Murr. Best references. But Henry wrote. It will excite me. You know how. In haste. Henry. Greek E. Better add postscript. What is he playing now? Improvising. Intermezzo. P.S. The rum-tum-tum. How will you pun? You punish me? Crooked skirt swinging. Whack by. Tell me I want to. No. Oh. Course if I didn't I wouldn't ask. La 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 ri. Trails off there, sad in minor. Why minor sad? Sign H. They like sad tale at end. P.P.S. La 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 re. I feel so sad today. La re. So lonely. D. He blotted quick on pad of pat. Envel. Address. Just copy out of paper. Murmured. Messrs. Callan, Coleman, and Company Limited. Henry wrote. Miss Martha Clifford, care of P.O., Dolphin's Barn Lane, Dublin. Blot over the other so he can't read. There, right. Idea prize titbit. Something detective read off blotting pad. Payment at the rate of guinea per call. Matcham often thinks the laughing witch. Poor Mrs. Purefoy. U.P. Up. Too poetical that about the sad. Music did that. Music hath charms, Shakespeare said. Quotations every day in the year, to be or not to be, wisdom while you wait. In Gerard's rosary of Fetter Lane he walks. Grey a burn. One life is all, one body do, but do. 
Done, anyhow. Postal order, stamp, post office lower down. Walk now, enough. Barney Kiernan's I promised to meet them. Dislike that job. House of mourning. Walk. Pat. Doesn't hear. Deaf beetle he is. Car near there now. Talk, talk. Pat. Doesn't. Settling those napkins. Lot of ground he must cover in the day. Paint face behind on him, then he'd be too. Wish they'd sing more. Keep my mind off. Bald Pat, who is bothered, mitred the napkins. Pat is a waiter hard of his hearing. Pat is a waiter who waits while you wait. He 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 he, he waits while you wait. He he, a waiter is he. He 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 he, he waits while you wait. While you wait, if you wait, he will wait while you wait. He 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 ho, wait while you wait. Deuce now, deuce Lydia, bronze and rose. She had a gorgeous, simply gorgeous time, and look at the lovely shell she brought. To the end of the bar to him she bore lightly the spiked and winding sea horn that he, George Lidwell, solicitor, might hear. Listen, she bade him. Under Tom Kernan's gin-hot words the accompanist wove music slow. Authentic fact. How Walter Bapti lost his voice. Well, sir, the husband took him by the throat. Scoundrel, said he, you'll sing no more love-songs. He did, faith, sir Tom. Bob Cowley wove. Tenors get womb. Cowley lay back. Ah, now he heard, she holding it to his ear. Here, he heard. Wonderful! She held it to her own, and through the sifted light pale gold in contrast gilded, to hear. Tap. Bloom through the bar door saw a shell held at their ears. He heard more faintly that they heard, each for herself alone, than each for other, hearing the plash of waves, loudly a silent roar. Bronze by a weary gold, a near, a far, they listened. Her ear, too, is a shell, the peeping lobe there, been to the seaside, lovely seaside girls, skin tanned raw, should have put on cold cream first make it brown, buttered toast. Oh, and that lotion mustn't forget. Fever near her mouth. Your head it simply, hair braided over, shell with seaweed. Why do they hide their ears with seaweed hair? And Turks the mouth, why? Her eyes over the sheet, yashmak. Find the way in, a cave. No admittance except on business. The sea, they think they hear, singing, a roar. The blood it is, souse in the ear sometimes. Well, it's a sea, corpuscle islands. Wonderful, really, so distinct, again. George Lidwell held its murmur, hearing, then laid it by gently. "'What are the wild waves saying?' he asked her, smiled. Charming, see, smiling, and unanswering, Lydia on Lidwell smiled. Tap. By Larry O'Rourke's, by Larry, bold Larry O. Boylan swayed, and Boylan turned. From the forsaken shell Miss Mina glided to her tankards waiting. No, she was not so lonely, archly, Miss Deuce's head let Mr. Lidwell know. Walks in the moonlight by the sea. No, not alone. With whom? She nobly answered, with a gentleman friend. Bob Cowley's twinkling fingers in the treble played again. The landlord has the prior. A little time. Long John, Big Ben, lightly he played a light, bright, tinkling measure for tripping ladies, Arch and smiling, and for their gallants, gentlemen friends. One, 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 two, one, three, four. Sea, wind, leaves, thunder, waters, cows lowing, the cattle market, cocks, hens don't crow, snakes hiss. There's music everywhere. Rutledge's door, e creaking. No, that's noise. Minuet of Don Giovanni he's playing now. Court dresses of all descriptions in castle chambers dancing. Misery. Peasants outside. Green starving faces eating dock leaves. Nice that is. Look, 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 look. You look at us. That's joyful, I can feel. Never have written it. Why? My joy is other joy. But both are joys. Yes, joy it must be. 
Mere fact of music shows you are. Often thought she was in the dumps till she began to lilt. Then, no. McCoy Valise. My wife and your wife. Squealing cat. Like tearing silk. Tongue when she talks like the clapper of a bellows. They can't manage men's intervals. Gap in their voices, too. Fill me. I'm warm, dark, open. Molly in qui est homo. Mercadante. My ear against the wall to hear. Want a woman who can deliver the goods. Jog, jig, jog, stopped. Dandy tan shoe of dandy boylan socks. Sky blue clocks came light to earth. Oh, look, we are so. Chamber music. Could make a kind of pun on that. It is a kind of music I often thought when she. Acoustics, that is, tinkling. Empty vessels make most noise. Because the acoustics, the resonance changes at, according as the weight of the water is equal to the law of falling water. Like those rhapsodies of Liszt's, Hungarian, gypsy eyed, pearls, drops, rain, diddle idle laddle addle oodle oodle, hiss. Now, maybe now, before. One rapped on a door, one tapped with a knock. Did he knock Paul de Cock with a loud, proud knocker with a cock? Cara, 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 cock, cock, cock. Tap. Quis degno, said Ben. Quis degno, Ben, said Father Cowley. No, Ben, Tom Kernan interfered. The croppy boy, our native Doric. Aye, do, Ben, Mr. Dedalus said, good men and true. Do, do, they begged in one. I'll go. Here, Pat, return, come. He came, he came, he did not stay. To me, how much? What key? Six sharps? F sharp major, Ben Dollard said. Bob Cowley's outstretched talons griped the black deep-sounding chords. Must go, Prince Bloom, told Richie Prince. No, Richie said. Yes, must. Got money somewhere. He's on for a razzle backache spree. Much? He see here's lip speech. One and nine. Penny for yourself. Here, give him tuppence tip. Deaf, bothered. But perhaps he has wife and family waiting. Waiting Patty come home. He 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 he. Deaf wait while they wait. But wait. But here. Chords dark. Lugugugubrious. Lo, in a cave of the dark middle earth. Embedded oar. Lump music. The voice of dark age, of unlove, earth's fatigue made grave approach and painful, come from afar, from hoary mountains, called on good men and true. The priest he sought. With him would he speak a word. Tap. Ben Dollard's voice, bass barrel tone, doing his level best to say it. Croak of vast, manless, moonless, womanless marsh. Other come down. Big ships Chandler's business he did once. Remember, rosiny ropes, ship's lanterns. Failed to the tune of ten thousand pounds. Now in the Ivig home. Cubicle number so-and-so. Number one base did that for him. The priest's at home. A false priest's servant bade him welcome. Step in, the Holy Father. With bows a traitor servant. Curly cues of cords. Ruin them, wreck their lives, then build them cubicles to end their days in. Hushabye, lullaby, die, dog, little dog, die. The voice of warning, solemn warning, told them the youth had entered a lonely hall, told them how solemn fell his footsteps there, told them the gloomy chamber, the vested priest sitting to shrive. Decent soul, bit addled now, thinks he'll win in answers, poet's picture puzzle. We hand you crisp five-pound note. Bird sitting, hatching in a nest. Lay of the last minstrel, he thought it was. See blank T, what domestic animal? T-R, most courageous mariner. Good voice he has still. No eunuch yet, with all his belongings. Listen. Bloom listened. Richie Golding listened. And by the door, deaf Pat, bald Pat, tipped Pat, listened. The chords harped slower. The voice of penance and of grief came slow, embellished, tremulous. Ben's contrite beard confessed. In nomine domini, in God's name he knelt. 
he beat his hand upon his breast, confessing, Mea culpa. Latin again, that holds them like bird lime, priest with the communion corpus for those women, chap in the mortuary, coffin or coffee corpus nomine. Wonder where that rat is by now. Scrape, tap. They listened, Hankards and Miss Kennedy, George Lidwell, eyelid well expressive, full busted satin, Kernan, sigh. The sighing voice of sorrow sang, his sins. Since Easter he had cursed three times, you bitches bast, and once at mass time he had gone to play. Once by the churchyard he had passed, and for his mother's rest he had not prayed. A boy, a croppy boy. Bronze, listening by the beer pole, gazed far away, soulfully. Doesn't half know I'm. Molly, great dab at seeing anyone looking. Bronze gazed far sideways. Mirror there. Is that best side of her face? They always know. Knock at the door. Last tip to titivate. Cock cara cara. What do they think when they hear music? Way to catch rattlesnakes. Night Michael Gunn gave us the box. Tuning up. Shah of Persia liked that best. Remind him of home sweet home. Wiped his nose in curtain, too. Custom his country, perhaps. That's music, too. Not as bad as it sounds. Tootling. Brasses braying asses through up-trunks. Double basses helpless, gashes in their sides. Woodwinds mooing cows. Semi-grand open crocodile music hath jaws. Woodwind, like Goodwind's name. She looked fine. Her crocus dress she wore low-cut, belongings on show. Clove her breath was always in theatre when she bent to ask a question. Told her what Spinoza says in that book of poor Papa's. Hypnotized, listening, eyes like that. She bent. Chap in dress circle staring down into her with his opera glass for all he was worth. Beauty of music you must hear twice. Nature woman half a look. God made the country, man the tune, met him pike hoses, philosophy, O oh, rocks. All gone, all fallen, at the siege of Ross his father, at Gory all his brothers fell. To Wexford, we are the boys of Wexford, he would, last of his name and race. I too, last of my race, Milly young student. Well, my fault, perhaps. No son. Rudy? Too late now. Or if not, if not, if still? He bore no hate. Hate, love, those are names. Rudy. Soon I am old. Big Ben, his voice unfolded. Great voice, Richie Goulding, said, a flush, struggling in his pale, to bloom soon old. But when was young? Ireland comes now, my country above the king, she listens. Who fears to speak of nineteen four? Time to be shoving. Looked enough. Bless me, father, dollared the croppy cried. Bless me and let me go. Tap. Bloom looked, unblessed, to go. Got up to kill, on eighteen bob a week. Fellows shell out the dibs. Want to keep your weather eye open, those girls, those lovely, by the sad sea waves. Chorus girls romance. Letters read out for breach of promise. From Chickabiddy's owny mumpsy pum. Laughter in court. Henry, I never signed it. The lovely name you. Lo sank the music, air and words, then hastened. The false priest rustling soldier from his cassock. A yeoman captain. They know it all by heart. The thrill they itch for. Yeoman cap. Tap, tap. Thrilled, she listened, bending in sympathy to hear. Blank face. Virgin, should say, or fingered only. Write something on it. Page. If not, what becomes of them? Decline, despair. Keeps them young. Even admire themselves. See, play on her. Lip blow. Body of white woman. A flute alive. Blow gentle. Loud. Three holes, all women. Goddess, I didn't see. They want it. Not too much polite. That's why he gets them. Gold in your pocket, brass in your face. Say something. Make her hear. With look to look. Songs without words. Molly, that hurdy-gurdy boy. She knew he meant the monkey was sick, or because so like the Spanish. 
Understand animals, too, that way, Solomon did, gift of nature. Ventriloquies, my lips closed, think in my stum, what? Will, you, I, want, you, too? With hoarse, rude fury the yeoman cursed, swelling an apoplectic bitch's bastard. A good thought, boy, to come. One hour's your time to live, your last. Tap, tap. Thrill now, pity they feel, to wipe away a tear for martyrs that want to, dying to die. For all things dying, for all things born. Poor Mrs. Purefoy, hope she's over, because they're wombs. A liquid of womb of woman eyeball gazed under a fence of lashes, calmly hearing. See real beauty of the eye when she not speaks, on yonder river. At each slow, satiny, heaving bosom's wave, her heaving embon, red rose, rose, slowly sank red rose. Heart beats, her breath, breath that is life, and all the tiny, tiny fern foils trembled of maidenhair. But look! The bright stars fade, O oh, Rose, Castile, the morn, ha, Lidwell, for him not, for him then not for, infatuated, I like that, see her from here, though, popped corks, splashes of beer froth, stacks of empties. On the smooth jutting beer pole laid Lydia hand, lightly, plumply, leave it to my hands, all lost in pity for croppy, fro to, to fro, over the polished knob, she knows his eyes, my eyes, her eyes, her thumb and finger passed in pity, passed, reposed, and, gently touching, then slid so smoothly, sliding down, a cool, firm, white enamel baton protruding through their sliding ring. With a cock, with a cara. Tap, tap, tap. I hold this house, amen. He gnashed in fury, traitors swing. The cords consented. Very sad thing, but had to be. Get out before the end. Thanks, that was heavenly. Where's my hat? Pass by her. Can leave the freeman. Letter I have. Suppose she were the— No, walk, walk, walk. Like Cashel, Boilo, Conoro, Coilo, Tisdal, Maurice, Tisntdal, Farrell. Walk. Well, I must be. Are you off? You're from spies. Bloom stop. Oh, a rye high blue. Ow. Bloom stood up. Soap feeling, rather sticky behind. Must have sweated. Music. That lotion, remember. Well, so long, high grade, card inside, yes. By deaf pat in the doorway, straining ear, Bloom passed. At Geneva Barrack that young man died. At passage was his body laid. Dolor. Oh, he Dolores. The voice of the mournful chanter called to Dolores' prayer by rose, by satiny bosom, by the fondling hand, by slops, by empties, by popped corks, greeting and going, past eyes and maiden hair, bronze and faint gold in deep sea shadow, went bloom, soft bloom, I feel so lonely bloom. Tap, tap, tap. Pray for him, prayed the base of Dollard. You who hear in peace, breathe a prayer, drop a tear, good men, good people. He was the croppy boy. Scaring, eavesdropping, boots, croppy boots boy bloom in the Ormond hallway, heard the growls and roars of Bravo, fat back-slapping, their boots all treading, boots, not the boots, the boy. General chorus, off for a swill to wash it down, glad I avoided. "'Come on, Ben,' Simon Dedalus cried. "'By God, you're as good as ever you were.' "'Better,' said Tom Jin Kernan. "'Most trenchant rendition of that ballad upon my soul and honour, it is it.' "'It is.' "'La Blache,' said Father Cowley. "'Ben Dollard bulkily cachicad towards the bar, "'mightily praise-fed, and all big roseate on heavy-footed feet, "'his gouty fingers knackering castanets in the air.' Big Benaben Dollard, Big Ben Ben, Big Ben Ben, Rrrr. And deep moved all, Simon trumping compassion from foghorn nose, all laughing, they brought him forth, Ben Dollard, in right good cheer. You're looking rubicund, George Lidwell said. Miss Deuce composed her rose to wait. 
"'Ben McCree,' said Mr. Dedalus, clapping Ben's fat back shoulder-blade. "'Fit as a fiddle only has a lot of adipose tissue concealed about his person.' "'Rrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
wonder how it first struck him. Sitting at home after pig's cheek and cabbage, nursing it in the armchair, rehearsing his band part, pom, pompity, jolly for the wife, asses' skins, welt them through life, then wallop after death, pom, wallop, seems to be what you call yashmak, or I mean kismet, fate. Tap, tap. A stripling, blind, with a tapping cane, came tap, tap, tapping by Dally's window, where a mermaid hair, all streaming, but he couldn't see, blew whiffs of a mermaid, blind couldn't, mermaid, coolest whiff of all. Instruments, a blade of grass, shell of her hands, then blow. Even comb and tissue paper you can knock a tune out of. Molly in her shift in Lombard Street West, hair down. I suppose each kind of trade made its own, don't you see? Hunter with a horn, haw, have you the... Cloche, sonnez la, shepherd his pipe, pui little wee, policeman a whistle, locks and keys, sweep, four o'clock all's well, sleep. All is lost now, drum, pompity, wait, I know, town crier, bum bailiff, long john, waken the dead, pom, dignum, poor little nominee domini, pom, it is music. I mean, of course, it's all pom, 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 very much what they call da capo. Still, you can hear. As we march, we march along, march along. Pom. I must, really. <laughs> now, if I did that at a banquet, just a question of custom, Shah of Persia. Breathe a prayer, drop a tear. All the same, he must have been a bit of a natural not to see it was a yeoman cap, muffled up. Wonder who was that chap at the grave in the brown mackin. Oh, the whore of the lane! A frowsy whore with black straw sailor hat askew came glazily in the day along the quay towards Mr. Bloom. When first he saw that form endearing, yes, it is. I feel so lonely. Wet night in the lane. Horn, who had the hee haw she saw off her beat there. What is she? Hope she. Psst! Any chance of your wash? New Molly had me decked. Stout lady does be with you in the brown costume. Put you off your stroke, that. Appointment we made, knowing we'd never, well, hardly ever. Too dear, too near to home, sweet home. Sees me, does she? Looks a fright in the day. Face like a dip. Damn her. Oh, well, she has to live like the rest. Look in here. In Lionel Marx's antique sale shop window, haughty Henry Lionel Leopold, dear Henry Flower, earnestly Mr. Leopold Bloom envisaged battered candlesticks, melodeon oozing maggoty blow-bags. Bargain, six bob. Might learn to play. Cheap. Let her pass. Of course everything is dear if you don't want it. That's what good salesman is. Make you buy what he wants to sell. Chap sold me the Swedish razor he shaved me with. Wanted to charge me for the edge he gave it. She's passing now. Six bob. Must be the cider. Or perhaps the burgund. Near bronze from a near, near gold from afar, they chinked their clinking glasses all, bright-eyed and gallant, before bronze Lydia's tempting last rose of summer, rose of Castile. First lid, d cow, care, doll, a fifth, Lidwell, Cy Dedalus, Bob Cowley, Carnan, and Big Ben Dollard. Tap! A youth entered a lonely Ormond hall. Bloom viewed a gallant pictured hero in Lionel Marx's window. Robert Emmett's last words, seven last words, of Meyerbeer, that is. True men like you, men. Ay, ay, Ben. We'll lift your glass with us. They lifted. Chink, chunk, tip. An unseeing stripling stood in the door. He saw not bronze, he saw not gold. Nor Ben, nor Bob, nor Tom, nor Cy, nor George, nor Tanks, nor Richie, nor Pat. He, 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 he did not see. Sea Bloom, Grease Bloom, viewed last words, softly, when my country takes her place among. Purr, purr. Must be the burr. Pff, ooh, rupper. Nations of the earth. No one behind. She's past. Then and not till then. Tram, cran, cran, cran. Good opera. Coming. Crandall, cran, cran. I'm sure it's the burgund. Yes, one, two. Let my epitaph be, cra, written I have, prf prf, done.
End of chapter 11b. Read by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. On June 16, 2006. In Oceanside, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L I B R I V O X dot org. Today's reading by Miette of Miette's Bedtime Story Podcast. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 12. I was just passing the time of day with old Troy of the DMP at the corner of Arbor Hill there, and be damned but a bloody sweep came along, and he nearly drove his gear into my eye. I turned around to let him have the weight of my tongue, when who should I see dodging along stony butter? Only Joe Hines. "'Lo, Joe,' says I, "'how are you blowing?' Did you see that bloody chimney sweep near shove my eye out with his brush? Soot's luck, says Joe. Who's the old ballocks you were talking to? Old Troy, says I, was in the farce. I'm on two minds not to give that fellow in charge for obstructing the thoroughfare with his brooms and ladders. What are you doing round these parts? says Joe. Devil a much, says I. There's a bloody big foxy thief beyond by the garrison church at the corner of Chicken Lane. Old Troy was just giving me a wrinkle about him. Lifted any god's quantity of tea and sugar to pay three bob a week. Said he had a farm in the county down off a hop of my thumb by the name of Moses Hetzog over there near Hylesbury Street. Circumcised, says Joe. Aye, says I, a bit off the top. "'an old plumber named Garrity. "'I'm hanging on to his towel now for the past fortnight, "'and I can't get a penny out of him.' "'That the lay you're on now,' says Joe. "'Aye,' says I. "'How are the mighty fallen, "'collector of barred and doubtful debts? "'But that's the most notorious bloody robber "'you'd meet in a day's walk.' and the face on him all pockmarks would hold a shower of rain. "'Tell him,' says he, "'I dare him,' says he, "'and I double dare him to send you round here again, "'or if he does,' says he, "'I'll have him summonsed up before the court, "'so I will, for trading without a license. "'And after he's stuffing himself till he's fit to burst, Jesus, I had to laugh at the little Jewy getting his shirt out. He drinks me my teas, he eat me my sugars, because he pay me my monies. Because he no pay me my monies. For non-perishable goods bought out of Moses Herzog of 13 St. Kevin's Parade in the city of Dublin, Wood Quayward, merchant, hereinafter called the vendor, and sold and delivered to Michael E. Geraghty, Esquire of 29 Arbor Hill in the city of Dublin. Aran Quayward, gentleman, hereinafter called the purchaser. Videlicet set five pounds avoir du poids of first choice tea at three shillings and no pence per pound avoir du poids, and three stone avoir du poids of sugar. Crushed crystal at three pence per pound avoir du poids. The said purchaser debtor to the said vendor of one pound five shillings and six pence sterling for value received, which amount shall be paid by said purchase to said vendor in weekly instalments every seven calendar days of three shillings and no pence sterling. And the said non-perishable goods shall not be pawned or pledged or sold or otherwise alienated by the said purchaser, but shall be, 
and remain and be held to be the sole and exclusive property of the said vendor to be disposed of at his good will and pleasure until the said amount shall have been duly paid by the said purchaser to the said vendor in the manner herein set forth as this day hereby agreed between the said vendor his heirs successors trustees and assigns of the one part and the said purchaser his heirs successor trustees and assigns of the other part are you a strict t t says joe not taking anything between drinks says i what about paying our respects to our friend says joe who says i sure he's out in john of god's off his head poor man drinking his own stuff says joe ay says i whisky and water on the brain come round to barney keenan's says joe I want to see the citizen. Barney Mavel means be it, says I. Anything strange or wonderful, Joe? Not a word, says Joe. I was up at that meeting in the city arms. What was that, Joe? says I. Cattle traders, says Joe, about the foot and mouth disease. I want to give the citizen the hard word about it. So we went around by Linenor Barracks and the back of the courthouse talking of one thing or another. Decent fellow Joe when he has a when he has it, but sure like that he never has it. Jesus, I couldn't get over that bloody foxy Garrity, the daylight robber. For trading without a license, says he. In Innisfail, the fair there, lies a land, the land of holy Mishan. There rises a watch-tower beheld of man afar. There sleep the mighty dead, as in life they slept, warriors and princes of high renown. A pleasant land it is, in sooth of murmuring waters, fishful streams where the sport, the gurned, the plays, the roach, the halibut, the gibbed haddock, the grills, the dab, the brill, the flounder, the pollock, the mixed coarse fish, generally, and other denizens of the aqueous kingdom too numerous to be enumerated. In the mild breezes of the west and of the east the lofty trees wave in different directions their first-class foliage, the wafty sycamore, the Lebanonian cedar, the exalted plane tree, the eugenic eucalyptus, and other ornaments of the arboreal world which that region is thoroughly well supplied. Lovely maidens sit in close proximity to the roots of the lowly, lovely trees, singing the most lovely songs, while they play all kinds of lovely objects, as, for example, golden ingots, silvery fishes, crumbs of herrings, draughts of eels, codlings, creels of fingerlings, purple sea-gems, and playful insects and heroes voyage from afar to woo them, from Ebelana to Sleeve Margie, the peerless princess of unfettered Munster and of Connacht, the just and of smooth, sleek Leinster, and of Cruan's land and of Armagh the splendid, and of the noble district of Boyle, princes, the sons of kings. And there rises a shining palace, a shining palace, whose crystal glittering roof is seen by mariners who traverse the extensive sea in barks built expressly for that purpose, and thither come all herds and fatlings and fistfuls of that land for O'Connell Fitzsimmon takes toll of them, a chieftain descended from chieftains. Thither the extremely large wains bring foison of the fields, flaskets of cauliflowers, floats of spinach, pineapple chunks, rangoon beans, strikes of tomatoes, drums of figs, trills of swedes, sulfurical potatoes, and tallies of iridescent kale, york and savoy, and trays of onions, pearls of the earth, and punnets of mushrooms, and custard marrows, and fat vetches, and beer, and rape, and red, green, yellow, brown, russet, sweet, big, bitter, ripe, pomelated apples, and chips of strawberries and seeds of gooseberries, 
toppy and pelurious, and strawberries fit for princes, and raspberries from their canes. Mm. I dare him, says he, and I double dare him. Come out here, Garrity, you notorious bloody hill and dale robber. And by that way wend the herds innumerable of bellwethers and flushed ewes and shearling rams and lambs and stubble geese and medium steers and roaring mares and pulled calves and long woods and store sheep and coofs prime springers and culls and sow pigs and bacon hogs and the various different varieties of highly distinguished swine and angle angus heifers and polly bullocks of immaculate pedigree together with prime premiated milk cows and beeves and there has ever heard a trampling cackling roaring lowing bleating bellowing rumbling grunting champing chewing of sheep and pigs and heavy hoofed kind from pasture lands of lusk and rush and carrick mines and from the steamy vales of thormund from the mcgiddies reeks the inaccessible and lordly shannon the unfathomable and from the gentle declivities of the place of the race of keir their udders distended with superabundance of milk and butts of butter and rennets of cheese and farmers firkins and targets of lamb and crannocks of corn and oblong eggs in great hundreds various in size the agate with this done so we turned into barney kiernan's and there Sure enough, was the citizen up in the corner having a great confab with himself, and that bloody mangy mongrel Gary Owen, and he waiting for what the sky would drop in the way of drink. There he is, says I, in his glory hole, with his cruising lawn and his load of papers, working for the cause. The bloody mongrel let a grass out of him would give you the creeps be a corporal work of mercy if someone would take the life of that bloody dog. I'm told for a fact he ate a good part of the breeches off a constabulary man in Santry that came round one time with a blue paper about a license. Stand and deliver, says he. That's all right, citizen, says Joe. Friends here. Pass, friends, says he. Then he rubs his hand in his eye and says he... What's your opinion of the times? Doing the rappery and the roary of the hill, but, be gob, Joe was equal to the occasion. I think the markets are on a rise, says he, sliding his hand down his fork. So, be gob, the citizen claps his paw on his knee, and he says, Foreign wars is the cause of it. And says Joe, sticking his thumb in his pocket, it's the Russians wish to tyrannize. Ara, give over your bloody coddling, Joe, says I. I've a thirst in me that wouldn't sell for half a crown. Give it a name, citizen, says Joe. Wine of the country, says he. What's yours, says Joe. Ditto Macnaspy, says I. Three pints, Terry, says Joe. And how's the old heart, citizen, says he. Never better, Echara, says he. What, Gary, are we going to win, eh? And with that he took the bloody old towser by the scruff of the neck, and, by Jesus, he near throttled him. The figure seated on a large boulder at the foot of a round tower was that of a broad-shouldered, deep-chested, strong-limbed, frank-eyed, red-haired, freely freckled, shaggy-bearded, wide-mouthed, large-nosed, long-headed, deep-voiced, bare-kneed, brawny-handed, hairy-legged, ruddy-faced, sinewy-armed hero. From shoulder to shoulder he measured several L's, and his rook-like mountainous knees were covered, as was likewise the rest of his body wherever visible, with a strong growth of tawny prickly hair in hue, and toughness similar to the mountain gorse, Eulex Europius.
the wide-winged nostrils from which bristles of the same tawny hue projected were of such capaciousness that within their cavernous obscurity the field lark might easily have lodged her nest the eyes in which a tear and a smile strove ever for the mastery were of the dimensions of a good-sized cauliflower a powerful current of warm breath issued at regular intervals from the profound cavity of his mouth while in rhythmic resonance the loud strong hail reverberations of his formidable heart thundered rumblingly causing the ground the summit of the lofty tower and the still loftier walls of the cave to vibrate and tremble he wore a long, unsleeved garment of recently flayed ox-hide reaching to the knees in a loose kilt, and this was bound about his middle by a girdle of plaited straw and rushes. Beneath this he wore trews of deer-skin, roughly stitched with gut. His nether extremities were encased in high balbriggan buskins dyed in lichen purple the feet being shod with brogues of salted cowhide laced with the windpipe of the same beast from his girdle hung a row of sea stains which jangled at every movement of his portentous frame and on these were graven with rude yet striking art the tribal images of many irish heroes and heroines of antiquity cajulin con of hundred battles nial of nine hostages brian of kinkora the Ardry Malachi, Art McMurra, Shane O'Neill, Father John Murphy, Owen Rowe, Patrick Sarsfield, Red Hugh O'Donnell, Red Jim McDermott, Suggeth Owen O'Groney, Michael Dwyer, Francie Higgins, Henry Joy McCracken, Goliath, Horace Wheatley, Thomas Conniff, Peg Woofington, the village blacksmith, Captain Moonlight, Captain Boycott, Dante Alighieri, Christopher Columbus, S. Fiercer, S. Brendan, Marshall McCowan, Charlemagne, Theobald Wolfe Tone, the mother of the Maccabees, the last of the Mohicans, the Rose of Castile, the man for Galway, the man that broke the bank at Monte Carlo, the man in the gap, the woman who didn't, Benjamin Franklin, Napoleon Bonaparte, John L. Sullivan, Cleopatra, Savoon in Delish, Julius Caesar, Paraclesis, Sir Thomas Lipton, William Tell, Michelangelo Hayes, Muhammad, the Bride of Lammermoor, Peter the Hermit, Peter the Packer, Dark Rosaline, Patrick Lam uh, Patrick W. Shakespeare, Brian Confucius, Myrtle Gutenberg, Patricio Velasquez, Captain Nemo, Tristan and Isolde, the First Prince of Wales, Thomas Cook and Son, the Bold Soldier Boy, Arana Pogue, Dick Lurpin, Ludwig Beethoven, the Colleen Bourne, Wada Healy, Angus the Cooldee, Dolly Mount, Sidney Parade, Ben Houth, Valentine Greetrix, Adam and Eve, Arthur Wellesley, Boss Crocker, Herodotus, Jack the Giant Killer, Gotma Buddha, Lady Godiva, the Lily of Killarney, Balor of the Evil Eye, the Queen of Sheba, Aki Nagel, Joe Nagel, Alessandra Volta, Jeremiah O'Donovan Rusa, Don Philip Don Philip O'Sullivan Beer, a couched spear of accumulated granite rested by him while at his feet reposed a savage animal of the canine tribe, whose steatorous gasps announced that he was sunk in uneasy slumber, a supposition confirmed by the hoarse growls and spasmodic movements which his master repressed from time to time by tranquilizing blows of a mighty cudgel rudely fashioned out of Paleolithic stone. So, anyhow, Terry brought the three pints. Joe was standing and begobbed. The sight nearly left my eyes when I saw him land out a quid. Oh, as true as I'm telling you. A good looking sovereign. And there's more where that came from, says he. Were well, you robbing the poor box, Joe? says I. Sweat to my brow, says Joe, twas the prudent member gave me the wheeze. I saw him before I met you, says I, sloping around by Piddle Lane and Greek Street with his cod's eye, counting up all the guts of the fish. Who comes through Mission's land, bed light and sable armour? 
O oh, Bloom, the son of Rory, it is he. Impervious to fear is Rory's son, he of the prudent soul. For the old woman of Prince's Street, says the citizen, the subsidised organ. The pledge-bound party on the floor of the house. And look at this blasted rag, says it. Look at this, says he, the Irish Independent, if you please, founded by Parnell to be the working man's friend. Listen to the births and deaths in the Irish for all Ireland Independent, and I'll thank you and the marriages. And he starts reading them out. <clears throat> Gordon, Barnfield Crescent, Exector, Redman of Ifley. St. Anne's on Sea, the wife of William T. Redman of a son. How's that, eh? Wright and Flint, Vincent and Gillette to Rutha Marion, daughter of Rosa and the late George Alfred Gillette, 179, Chapham Road, Stockwell, Playwood and Risdale, at St. Jude's, Kensington, by way of the very Reverend Dr. Forrest, Dean of Worcester, eh? Deaths. Bristow at Whitehall Lane, London. Car stroke Newington of gastritis and heart disease. Cookburn at the Moat House. Chepstow. I know that fellow, says Joe, from bitter experience. Cookburn. Dimsey, wife of David Dimsey, late of the Admiralty. Jesus. Miller Tottenham, aged eighty five, Welsh, June twelfth, at thirty five Cunning Street, Liverpool, Isabella Helen. How's that for a national press, eh, my grandson? How's that for Martin Murphy, the Bantry jobber? Ah, oh, well, says Joe, handing round the booze. Thanks be to God they had the start of us. Drink that, citizen. Health, Joe, says I, and all down the farm. Ah, ow, don't be talking. I was blue mouldy for the want of that pint. Declare to God I could hear it hit the pit of my stomach with a click. And lo, as they quaffed their cup of joy, a godlike messenger came swiftly in, radiant as the eye of heaven, a comely youth, and behind him there passed an elder of noble gait and countenance, bearing the sacred scrolls of law, and with him his lady, wife, a dame of peerless lineage, fairest of her race. Little Alf Bergen, popped in round the door, and hid behind Barney's snug, squeezed up with the laughing. And who was sitting up there in the corner that I hadn't seen snoring drunk, blind to the world? Only Bob Dorin. I didn't know what was up, and Alf kept making signs out of the door. And begob, what was it only that bloody old pantaloon Dennis Breen in his bath slippers, with two bloody big books tucked under his oxter, and the wife hot foot after him? Unfortunate, wretched woman! Trotting like a poodle! I thought Alf would spit. Look at him, says he. Breen, he's traipsing all round Dublin with a postcard someone sent him with you pe up on it to take a lit, and he doubled up. Take a what? says I. Libel action, says he, for ten thousand pounds. Oh, hell, says I. The bloody mongrel began to growl. That had put the fear of God in you, seeing something was up. But the citizen gave him a kick in the ribs. Be I Joe hushed, says he. Who? says Joe. Breen, says Alf. He was in John Henry Menton's, and then he went round to Collins and Ward's, and then Tom Rookford met him and sent him round to the sub sheriff's for a lark. Oh, God, I've a pain laughing. You pee. The long fellow gave him an eye as good as a process, and now the bloody old lunatic has gone round to Green Street to look for a G-man. When is Long John going to hang that fellow in Mount Joy? 
says Joe. Bergen, says Bob Doran, waking up. Is that Alf Bergen? Yes, says Alf. Hanging? Wait till I show you. Here, Terry, give us a pony, that bloody old fool, ten thousand pounds. You should have seen Long John's eye. You pee. And he started laughing. Who are you laughing at, says Bob Doran. Is that Bergen? Hurry up, Terry boy, says Alf. Terence O'Ryan heard him, and straightway brought him a crystal cup full of the foamy Eben Ale, which the noble twin brothers Bonnevy and Bunganan brew ever in their divine Elvats, cunning as the sons of deathless leader. For the garner the succulent berries of the hop and moss and sift and bruise and brew them, and they mix therewith sour juices, and bring the must to the sacred fire, and cease not night or day from their toil, those cunning brothers, lords of the vat. Then did you, chivalrous Terence, hand forth as to the manner born, and you offered the crystal cup to him that thirsted, the soul of chivalry, in beauty akin to the immortals. But he, the young chief of the Obergans, could ill brook to be outdone in generous deeds, but gave therefore with gracious gesture a testoon of costliest bronze. Thereon embossed in excellent smithwork was seen the image of a queen of regal port, scion of the house of Brunswick, Victoria her name. Her most excellent majesty, by grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, and of the British dominions beyond the sea, queen, defender of the faith, empress of India, even she, who bore rule, a victress over many peoples, the well-beloved, for they knew and loved her from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof, the pale, the dark, the ruddy, and the Ethiop. "'What's that bloody Freemason doing?' says the citizen, prowling up and down outside. "'What's that?' said Joe. "'Here you are,' says Alf, chucking at the rhino. Talking about hanging, I'll show you something you never saw. Hang men's letters. Look at here. So he took a bundle of wisps of letters and envelopes out of his pocket. Are you codding? says I. Honest Injun, says Alf. Read them. So Joe took up the letters. Who are you laughing at? says Bob Doran. So I saw there was going to be a bit of a dust. Bob's a queer chap when the porter's up in him, so says I, just to make talk. How's Willie Murray these times, Alf? I don't know, says Alf. I saw him just now in Capel Street with Paddy Dingham. Only I was running after that. You what? says Joe, throwing down the letters. With who? With Dingham, says Alf. Is it Puddy? says Joe. Yes, says Alf. Why? Don't you know he's dead? says Joe. Potty Dingham, dead? says Alf. Aye, says Joe. Sure, I'm seeing him not five minutes ago, says Alf, as plain as a pike stuff. Who's dead? says Bob Doran. You saw his ghost then, says Joe. God between us and harm. What? says Alf. Good Christ, only five. What? And Willie Mary with him, the two of them there near. Who do you call him? What? Dingham dead. What about Dingham? says Bob Doran. Who's talking about? Dead, says Alf. He's no more dead than you are. Maybe so, says Joe. They took the liberty of burying him this morning anyhow. Paddy, says Alf. Aye, says Joe. He paid the debt of nature. God be merciful to him. Good Christ, says Alf. Begob, he was what you might call flabbergasted. 
in the darkness spirit hands were felt to flutter and when prayer by tantras had been directed to the proper quarter a faint but increasing luminosity of ruby light became gradually visible the apparition of the etheric double being particularly lifelike owing to the discharge of jivic rays from the crown of the head and face communication was effected through the pituitary body and also by means of the orange fiery and scarlet rays emanating from the sacral region and solar plexus questioned by his earth name as to his whereabouts and the heavenward he stated that he was now on the path of p r i y a or return but was still submitted to trial at the hands of certain bloodthirsty entities on the lower astral levels in reply to a question as to his first sensations in the general divide but beyond he stated that previously he had seen an as in a glass darkly, but that those who had passed over had summit possibilities of atmic development opened up to them. Interrogated as to whether life there resembled our experiences in the flesh, he stated that he had heard from the more favoured beings now in the spirit that their abodes were equipped with every modern home comfort, such as Talafana, Alvatar, Hatakeda, what a closet and the highest adepts were steeped in waves of volupsy of the purest nature having requested a quart of buttermilk this was brought and evidently afforded relief asked if he had any message for the living he exhorted all who were still at the wrong side of maya to acknowledge the true path for it was reported in divanic circles that mars and jupiter were out for mischief on the early eastern angle where the ram has power it was then queried whether there was any special desires on the part of the defunct and the reply was we greet you friends of earth who are still in the body mind c k doesn't pile it on it was ascertained that the reference was to mr cornelius kelleher manager of mrs Mrs. H. J. O'Neill's popular funeral establishment, a personal friend of the defunct who had been responsible for the carrying out of the internment arrangements. Before departing, he requested that it should be told to his dear son Patsy that the other boot which he had been looking for was at present under the commode in the return room, and the pair should be sent to Collins to be sold only as the heels were still good he stated that this had greatly perturbed his peace of mind in the other region and earnestly requested that his desire should be made known assurances were given that the matter would be attended to and it was intimated that this had given satisfaction he is gone from mortal haunts o dingham son of our morning fleet was his foot on the bracken patrick of the beamy brow whale bunber with your wind and whale o ocean with your whirlwind there he is again says the citizen staring out who says i bloom says he he's on point of duty up and down there for the last ten minutes and begob i saw his physog do a peep in and then slitter off again Little Alf was knocked backwards. Faith he was. Good Christ, says he. I could have sworn it was him. And says Bob Durin, with the hat on the back of his pole, lowest blackguard in Dublin when he's under the influence. <coughs> Who said Christ is good? I beg your parsnips, says Alf. Is that a good Christ, says Bob Durin, to take away the poor little Willie Dingham? ah well says alf trying to pass it off he's over all his troubles but bob doran shouts out of him he's a bloody ruffian i say to take away poor little willie dingham terry came down and tipped him the wick to keep quiet that they didn't want that kind of talk in a respectable licensed premises and bob doran starts doing the weeps about paddy dingham true as you're there 
the finest man, he says, snivelling, the finest, purest character. The tear is bloody near your eye, talking through his bloody hat, fitter for him to go to the little sleep-walking bitch he married, Mooney, the bumba bailiff's daughter, mother kept a kip in Hardwick Street. That used to be stravaging about the landings, bantam lions told me that he was stopping there at two in the morning without a stitch on her, exposing her person, open to all corners, fair field, and no favour. The noblest, the truest, says he, and he's gone, poor little Willie, poor little Paddy Dingham. And mournful, and with a heavy heart, he bewept the extinction of that beam of heaven. Old Garry Owen started growling again at Bloom that was skeezing round the door. Come in, come on, he won't eat you, said the citizen. So Bloom slopes in with his cod's eye on the dog, and he asks Terry, was Martin Cunningham there? Oh, Christ, McGowan, says Joe, reading one of the letters. Listen to this, will you? And he starts reading out one. 7 Hunter Street, Liverpool. To the High Sheriff of Dublin. Dublin. Honoured Sir, I beg to offer my services in the above-mentioned painful case I hanged Jogan in Bootle Jail on the 12th of February, 1900, and I hanged... Show us, Joe, says I. Private Arthur Chase for foul murder of Jesse Tilsit in Pentonville Prison, and I was assistant when... Jesus, says I. Billington executed the awful murderer, Toad Smith. The citizen made a grab at the letter. Hold hard, says Joe. I have a special knack of putting the noose. Once in, he can't get out. Hoping to be favoured, I remain. Honoured sir, my terms is five guineas. Hitch rumbled. Master Barber. And a barbarous bloody barbarian he is, too, says the citizen. And the dirty scrawl of the wretch, says Joe. Here, says he, take them to hell out of my sight. Off, oh, hello, Bloom, says he. What will you have? So they started arguing about the point. Bloom saying he wouldn't and he couldn't and excuse him no offence and all to that. And then he said, well... He'd just take a cigar. Gorby's a prudent member, and no mistake. Give us one of your prime stinkers, Terry, says Joe. And Alf was telling us there was one chap sent in a morning card with a black border round it. They're all barbers, says he, from the black country that would hang their own fathers for five quid down and travelling expenses. And he was telling us there's two fellows waiting below to pull his heels down when he gets the drop and choke him properly, and then they chop up the rope after and sell the bits for a few bob a skull. In the dark land they bide, the vengeful knights of the razor. Their deadly coil they grasp, yea, and therein they lead to Erebus whatsoever white hath done a deed of blood, for I will on no wise suffer it, even so saith the Lord. So they started talking about capital punishment, and of course Bloom comes out with the why and the wherefore and all the codology of the business, and the old dog smelling him all the time, I'm told those Jewies doors have a sort of queer odour coming off them for dogs, about I don't know what all that deterrent effect and so forth and so on. There's one thing it hasn't had a deterrent effect on, says Alf. What's that? said Joe. <laughs> Poor bugger's tool that's being hanged, says Alf. <gasps> that's so, says Joe. God's truth, says Alf. I heard that from the head warder that was in. 
kill me when they hanged Joe Brady, the invincible. He told me when they cut him down after the drop, it was standing up in their faces like a poker. Ruling passion strong in death, says Joe, as someone said. That could be explained by science, says Bloom. It's only a natural phenomenon, don't you see? Because on account of the... And then he starts with his jawbreakers about phenomenon and science and this phenomenon and the other phenomenon. The distinguished scientist, Herr Professor Lutpolt Blumenduft, tendered medical evidence to the effect that the instantaneous fracture of the cervical vertebrae and consequent season of the spinal cord would, according to the best approved tradition of medical science, be calculated to inevitably produce in the human subject a violent ganglionic stimulus of the nerve centres of the genital apparatus, thereby causing the elastic pores of the corpora cavernosa to rapidly dilate in such a way as to instantaneously facilitate the flow of blood to that part of the human anatomy known as the penis or male organ, resulting in the phenomenon which, has been denominated by the faculty a morbid upwards and outwards philoprogenitive erection in articulo multis per diminuinem captis. So, of course, the citizen was only waiting for the wink of the word, and he starts gassing out of him about the invincibles and the old guard and the men of sixty-seven, and who fears to speak of ninety-eight, and Joe with him all the fellows that were hanged, drawn and transported for the cause by drumhead court-martial, and a new island, and new this, that, and the other. Talking about new island, he ought to go and get a new dog, so he ought. Mangy, mangy ravenous brute sniffing and sneezing all round the place and scratching his scabs. And round he goes to Bob Durin that was standing out for half one sucking up for what he could get. So of course Bob Durin starts doing the bloody fool with him. Give us the poor, give us the poor doggy, good old doggy, give that poor here, give us the poor. Ah, ah, bloody end to the poor, he'd poor, and now for trying to keep him from tumbling off the bloody stool of the bloody old dog, and he's taking all kinds of drivel about training by kindness and thoroughbred dog and intelligent dog. Give you the bloody pip. Then he starts scraping a few bits of old biscuit out of the bottom of a Jacob's tin he told Terry to bring. Gob, he galloped it down like old boots, and his tongue hanging out of him a yard long for ma. Near ate the tin in all hungry bloody mongrel. And the citizen in bloom having an argument about the point, the brothers Shears and Wolf Tone beyond on Arbor Street and Robert, em Robert Emmett and die for your country, and Tommy Moore touch about Sarah Curran, and she's far from the land. And Bloom, of course, with his knock-me-down cigar, putting on swank with his lardy face. Phenomenon! The fat heap he married is a nice old phenomenon, with a back on her like a ballalley. Time they were stopping up in the city arms pisser, Burke told me there was an old one there, with a cracked luderman of a nephew, and Bloom trying to get the soft side of her, doing the mully-cuddle, playing by Zeke, to come in for a bit of the wampum in her will, and not eating meat of a Friday, because the old one was always thumping her crawl and taking the lout out for a walk. And one time he led him round the rounds of Dublin, and— by the holy farmer, he never cried crack till he brought him home as drunk as a boiled owl, and said he did it to teach him the evils of alcohol, and by herrings, if the three women didn't near roast him, it's a queer story, the old one, Bloom's wife, and Mrs. O'Dowd that kept the hotel. Jesus, I had to laugh at Pissa Burke taking them off chewing the fat. And Bloom with his, but don't you see, and but on the other hand. And sure, must be taken, the lout, I'm told, was in powers afar, the blenders, round in Cope Street, going home footless in a cab five times in the week, after drinking his way through all the samples in the bloody establishment. 
phenomenon. The memory of the dead, says the citizen, taking up his pint glass and glaring at Bloom. Aye, aye, says Joe. You don't grasp my point, says Bloom. What I mean is... Sin fain, says the citizen, sin fain a... I'm hen. The friends we love are by our side, and the foes we hate before us. The last farewell was affecting in the extreme. From the belfries, far and near, the funereal deathbed, death bell toiled unceasingly, while all around the gloomy precincts rolled the ominous warning of a hundred muffled drums, punctuated by the hollow booming of pieces of ordnance. The deafening clasps of thunder and the dazzling flashes of lightning which lit up the ghastly scene testified that the artillery of heaven had lent its supernatural pop to the already gruesome spectacle. A torrential rain poured down from the floodgates of the angry heavens upon the bared heads of the assembled multitude, which numbered at the lowest computation five hundred thousand persons. A posse of Dublin Metropolitan Police, superintended by the Chief Commissioner in person, maintained order in the vast throng from for whom the York Street brass and reed band whiled away the intervening time by admirably rendering on their black-draped instruments the matchless melody endeared to us from the cradle by Speranza's plaintive muse. Special quick excursions, trains and upholstered Charablancas had been provided for the comfort of our country cousins, of whom there were large contingents. Considerable amusement was caused by the favourite Dublin street singers, L. N. L. N. H. N. and M. L. L. G. N., who sang the night before Larry was stretched in their usual mirth provoking fashion. Our two inimitable drolls, did a roaring trade with their broadsheets among lovers of the comedy element, and nobody who has a corner in his heart for real Irish fun without vulgarity will grudge them their hard-earned pennies. The children of the male and female foundling hospital, who thronged the windows overlooking the scene, were delighted with this unexpected addition to the day's entertainment, and a word of praise is due to the little sisters of the poor for their excellent idea of affording the poor fatherless and motherless children a genuinely instructive treat. The viceregal house party, which included many well-known ladies, was chaperoned by their excellencies to the most favourable positions on the grandstand, while the picturesque, picturesque foreign delegation known as the Friends of the Emerald Isle was accommodated on a tribune directly opposite. The delegation, present in full force, consisted of Commentadore Bakabachi Beninobeninim, the semi-paralysed doyen of the party, who had to be assisted to a seat by the aid of a powerful steam crane. Monsieur Pierre Poul Petit Paton, the grand joker Vladimir Pukethanechef, the art joker Leopold Rudolf von Schwarzenbard Hoddenthaler, Countess Maha. Viraja Kisazoni Peter Pesci, Hiram Y. Bombust, Count Athanatos Karamapoulos, Ali Baba Bakshish, Rahat Locum Effendi, Senor Hidalgo Calballero Don Pacadillo y Palibras y Paternosta de la Mallorca de la Malaria, Hoko Poco Harakiri. He Hung Chang, Olaf Kobadettelessen, Mein He Trick von Trumps, Pan Poliax Paddy Risky, Goosepond Prixler Karabeshesha, Boris Hupenov, Herr Hurhaus Director President, Hans Schulens Storelli, National Gymnasium, Museum, Sanatorium, and Suspendorium, Sordinary, Private Docent, General History, Special Professor, Dr. Creekfield Unibangemen. 
all of the delegates without exception expressed themselves in the strongest possible heterogeneous terms concerning the nameless barbarity which they all had been called upon to witness an animated altercation in which all took part ensued among the f o t e i as to whether the eighth or ninth of march was the correct date of birth of ireland's patron saint in the course of argument cannon balls cimentars boomerangs blunderbusses stink pots met meat choppers umbrellas catapults knuckle dusters sandbags lumps of pig iron were resorted to and blows were freely exchanged the baby policeman constable mcfadden summoned by special courier from Bootestown, quickly restored order and with lightning promptitude proposed the seventeenth of the month as a solution equally honourable for both contending parties the ready-witted nine-footer's suggestion at once appealed to all and was unanimously accepted constable mcfadden was heartily congratulated by all the f o t e i several of whom were bleeding profusely commentatore benino benoni having been extricated from underneath the presidential armchair it was explained by his legal adviser avocato pagamini that the various articles secreted in his thirty-two pockets had been abstracted by him during the affray from the pockets of his junior colleagues in the hope of bringing them to their senses the objects which included several hundred ladies and gentlemen's gold and silver watches were promptly restored to their rightful owners and generally harmony reigned supreme quietly unassumingly rumbled stepped on to the scaffold in faultless morning dress and wearing his favourite flower the gladiolus cruentus he announced his presence by that gentle Rambolian cough, which so many have tried unsuccessfully to imitate. Short, painstaking, yet withal so characteristic of the man. The arrival of the world renowned headsman was greeted by a roar of acclamation from the huge concourse, the viceregal ladies waving their handkerchiefs in their excitement, while the even more excitable foreign delegates cheered vociferously in a medley of cries, Hook, Bonsai, Elgin, Zivio, Chin Chin, Polychronia, Hip Hip, Viva, Allah, amid which the ringing Aviva of the delegate of the Land of Song, a high double F recalling these piercingly lovely notes, with which the eunuch Catalani beglamoured our great-great-grandmothers, was easily distinguishable. It was exactly seventeen o'clock. The signal for prayer was then promptly given by megaphone, and in an instant all heads were bowed. The commentadores patriarchal sombrero, which has been in the possession of his family since the revolution of Rienzi, being removed by his medical adviser in attendance, Dr. Pippi, the learned prelate who administered the last comforts of holy religion to the hero martyr when about to pay the death penalty knelt in a most christian spirit in a pool of rain-water his cassock above his hoary head and offered up to the throne of grace fervent prayers of supplication hand by the block stood the grim figure of the executioner his visage being concealed in a tangalon pot with two circular perforated apertures through which his eyes glowered furiously. As he awaited the fatal signal, he tested the edge of his horrible weapon by honing it upon his brawny forearm, or decapitated in rapid succession a flock of sheep which had been provided by the admirers of the fell but necessary office. On a handsome mahogany table near him were neatly arranged the quartering knife the various finely tempered disembowelling appliances specially supplied by the world-famous firm of cutlers messrs john round and sons sheffield a terracotta saucepan for the reception of the duodenum colon blind intestine and appendix etc once successfully extracted and two commodious milk jugs destined to receive the most precious blood of the most precious victim the house steward of the amalgamated cats and dogs home was in attendance to convey these vessels when replenished to that beneficent institution quite an excellent repast consisting of rashers and eggs fried steak and onions done to a nicety 
delicious hot breakfast rolls and invigorating tea had been considerately provided by the authorities for the consumption of the central figure of the tragedy who was in capital spirits when prepared for death and evinced the keenest interest in the proceedings from beginning to end but he with an abnegation rare in our times rose nobly to the occasion and expressed the dying wish immediately acceded to that the meal should be divided in aliquot parts among the members of the sick and indulgent room-keepers association as a token of his regard and esteem the n e c and non plus ultra of emotion were reached when the blushing bride-elect burst her way through the serried ranks of the bystanders and flung herself upon the muscular bosom of him who was about to be launched into eternity for her sake the hero folded her willowy form in a loving embrace murmuring fondly sheila my own encouraged by this use of her christian name she kissed passionately all the various suitable areas of his person which the decencies of prison garb permitted her ardour to reach she swore to him as they mingled the salt streams of their tears that she would ever cherish his memory that she would never forget her hero boy who went to his death with a song on his lips as if he were but going to a hurling match in clontic park she brought back to his recollection the happy days of blissful childhood together on the banks of anna liffey when they had indulged in the innocent pastimes of youth and oblivious of the dreadful present they both laughed heartily all the spectators including the venerable pastor joining in the general merriment that monster audience simply rocked with delight but anon they were overcome with grief and clasped their hands for the last time a fresh torrent of tears burst from the lac lacrimal ducks and the vast concourse of people touched to the inmost core broke into heart rendering sobs not the least affected being the aged prebendary himself big strong men officers of the peace and genial giants of the royal irish constabulary were making frank use of the handkerchiefs and it is safe to say that there was not a dry eye in that record assemblage a most romantic incident occurred when a handsome young oxford graduate noted for his chivalry towards the fair sex stepped forward and presenting his visiting card bank book and genealogical tree solicited the hand of the hapless young lady requesting her to name the day and was accepted on the spot every lady in the audience was presented with a tasteful souvenir of the occasion in the shape of a skull and crossbones brooch a timely and general generous act which evoked a fresh outburst of emotion and when the gallant young oxonian the bearer by the way of one of the most time-honoured names in albion's history placed on the finger of his blushing fiancee an expensive engagement ring with emeralds set in the form of a four-leafed shamrock the excitement knew no bounds nay even the stern provost marshal lieutenant colonel tompkin maxwell french mullen tomlinson who presided on the sad occasion he who had blown a considerable number of sipoys from the cannon mouth without flinching could not now restrain his natural emotion with his mailed gauntlet he brushed away a furtive tear and was overheard by those privileged burghers who happened to be in his immediate entourage to murmur himself in a faltering undertone. God blimey if she ain't a clinker. There, that bleeding tart. Blimey, it makes me kind of bleed and cry straight it does when I sees her, cause I thinks of me old mustub what's waiting for me down lime house where. So then, the citizen begins talking about the Irish language in the corporation meeting, and all to that and the shoeneeds that can't speak their own language, and Joe chipping in because he stuck someone for a quid, and Bloom putting his old goo with his two-penny stump that he carged off of Joe, and talking about the Gaelic League, and the anti-treating League, and drink the curse of Ireland. Anti-treating is about the size of it. 
gob. He let you pour out all manner of drink down his throat till the Lord would call him before you'd ever see the froth of his pint. And one night I went in with a fellow into one of their musical evenings, song and dance about she could get up on a truss of hair as she could my morin lay, and there was a fellow with a ballyhooly blue ribbon barge spiffing out of him in Irish, and a lot of Colleen Browns going on with temperance beverages and selling medals and oranges and lemonade and a few old dry buns, gob, flagulag entertainment, don't be talking. Ireland sober is Ireland free. And then an old fellow starts blowing into his bagpipes, and all the gougers shuffling their feet to the tune of the old cow died of. And one or two sky pilots having an eye around that there was no goings on with the females, hitting below the belt. So how and ever, as I was saying, the old dog seeing the tin was empty starts mousing around by Joe and me. I'd train him by kindness, so I would if he was my dog. Give him a rousing fine kick now and again where it wouldn't blind him. Afraid he'll bite you, says the citizen, jeering. No, says I, but he might take my leg for a lamp post. So he calls the old dog over. What's on you, Gary? says he. Then he starts hauling and mauling and talking to him in Irish, and the old towels are growling, letting on to answer, like a duet in the opera. Such growling you never heard as they left off between them. Someone that has nothing better to do than to write a letter pro bono publico to the papers about the muzzling order for a dog the like of that growling and grousing, and his eye all bloodshot from their druses in it, and the hydrophobia dropping out of his jaws. All those who were interested in the spread of human culture among the lower animals, and their name is Legion, should make a point of not missing the really marvellous exhibition of cyanthropy given by the famous old Irish red setter wolf-dog formerly known by the sobriquet of Gary Owen, and recently rechristened by his large circle of friends and acquaintances, Owen Gary. The exhibition which is the result of years of training by kindness and a carefully thought-out dietary system, comprises, among other achievements, the recitation of verse. Our greatest living phonetic expert, wild horses shall not drag it from us, has left no stone unturned in his efforts to delucidate and compare the verse recited, and has found it bears a striking resemblance the italics are ours, to the rands of ancient Celtic bards. We are not speaking so much of those delightful love songs with which the writer, who conceals his identity under the graceful pseudonym of the little sweet branch, has familiarized the book-loving world, but rather, as a contributor, D.O.C. points out in an interesting communication published by an evening contemporary, of the harsher and more personal note which is found in the satirical effusions of the famous Rafferty and of Donald McConsign, to say nothing of a more modern lyrist at present very much in the public eye. We subjoin a specimen which has been rendered into English by an eminent scholar whose name for the moment we are not at liberty to disclose, though we believe that our readers will find the topical allusion rather more than an indication. The metrical system of the canine original, which recalls the intricate, alliterative, and isosyllabic rules of the Welsh englim, is infinitely more complicated, but we believe our readers will agree that the spirit has been well caught. Perhaps it should be added that the effect is greatly increased if Owen's verse be spoken somewhat slowly and indistinctly in a tone suggestive of suppressed rancour. <clears throat> the curse of my curses, seven days every day, and seven dry Thursdays on you, Barney Keenan, has no sup of water to cool my courage, and my gut red roaring after Lowry's lights. So he told Terry to bring some water for the dog, and gob, you could hear him laughing it, lapping it up a mile off. And Joe asked him, would he have another? I will, says he, a chara, to show there's no ill feeling. 
gob he's not as green as his cabbage looking arsing around from one pub to another leaving it to your own honour with old giltrap's dog and getting fed up by the ratepayers and corporators entertainment for man and beast and says joe could you make another hole in another pint could a swim duck says i same again terry says joe are you sure you won't have anything in the way of liquid refreshment says he thank you no says bloom as a matter of fact i just wanted to meet martin cunningham don't you see about this insurance of poor dingham's martin asked me to go to the house you see dingham i mean didn't serve any notice of the assignment on the company at the time and nominally under the act of the mortgages can't recover on the policy holy wars says joe laughing that's a good one if old shylock is landed so the wife comes out top dog what well that's a point says bloom for the wife's admirers whose admirers says joe the wife's advisers i mean says bloom then he starts all confused mucking it up about mortgager under the arc like the lord chancellor giving it out on the bench and for the benefit of the wife and that a trust is created but on the other hand that dingham owed bridgeman the money and if now the wife or the widow contested the mortgage's right till he near had the head of me addled with his mortgager under the arc he was bloody safe he wasn't running himself until that time as a rogue and vagabond only he had a friend in court selling bazaar tickets to what you call it royal hungarian privileged lottery true as you're there oh commend me to an israelite royal and privileged hungarian robbery so Bob Dorin comes lurching around asking Bloom to tell Mrs. Dingham he was sorry for her trouble, and he was very sorry about the funeral, and to tell her he said, and everyone who knew him said, that there was never a truer, finer person than poor little Willie that's dead to tell her. Choking with bloody foolery, and shaking Bloom's hand doing the tragic to tell her that. Shake hands, brother, you're a rogue, and I'm another let me said he so far presume upon our acquaintance which however slight it may appear if judged by the standard of mere time is founded as i hope and believe on a sentiment of mutual esteem as to request of you this favour but should i have overstepped the limits of reserve let the sincerity of my feelings be the excuse for my boldness no rejoined the other i appreciate to the full the motives which actuate your conduct and i shall discharge the office you entrust to me consoled by the reflection that though the errand be one of sorrow this proof of your confidence sweetens in me some measures of the bitterness of the cup then suffer me to take your hand said he the goodness of your heart, I feel sure, will dictate to you better than my inadequate words the expressions which are most suitable to convey an emotion whose poignancy, were I to give vent to my feelings, would deprive me even of speech. And off with him, and out trying to walk straight. Boost at five o'clock. Night he was near being lagged, only Paddy Leonard knew the bobby, Fortinet blind to the world up in a shebeen in bride street after closing time fornicating with two shawls and a bully on guard drinking porter out of teacups and calling himself a frenchy for the shawls joseph manuo and talking against the catholic religion and he serving mass in adam and eve's when he was young with his eyes shut who wore the new testament and the old testament and hugging and smugging and the two shawls killed with a laughing, picking his pockets, the bloody fool, and he spilled the porter all over his bed, and the two shawls screeching, laughing at one another. How is your testament? Have you got an old testament? Old Paddy was passing there, I tell you what. Then see him of a Sunday with his little concubine of a wife, and she wagging her tail up the aisle of the channels with her patient boots on her no less and her violets nice as pie doing the little lady 
Jack Mooney's sister, and the old prostitute of a mother procuring rooms to street couples. Gob! Jack made him toe the line. Told him if he didn't patch up the pot, Jesus, he'd kick the shite out of him. So, Terry brought the three pints. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot org. Today's reading by Miet of Miet's Bedtime Story Podcast. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 12, Part 2. Here, says Joe, doing the honours. Here, citizen. Slan Leet, says he. Fortune, Joe, says I. Good health, citizen. Gob, he had his mouth halfway down the tumbler already. What a small fortune to keep him in drinks. Who is the long fellow running for the mayoralty, Alf? says Joe. Friend of yours, says Alf. Nanan, says Joe. The member? I won't mention any names, says Alf. I thought so, says Joe. I saw him up at that meeting now with William Field, MP, the cattle traders. Harry Lopez, says the citizen, that exploded volcano, the darling of all countries and the idol of his own. So, Joe starts telling the citizen about the foot and mouth disease and the cattle traders and taking action in the matter and the citizen sending them all to the right about and bloom coming out with the sheep dip for the scab and a hoose drench for coughing calves and the guaranteed remedy for timber tongue because he was up one time in a knacker's yard Walking about with his book and pencil, here's my head and my heels are coming till Joe Cuff gave him the order of the boot for giving lip to a grazier. Mr. Noel, teach your grandmother how to milk ducks. Pisser Burke was telling me in the hotel the wife used to be in the rivers of tears sometimes with Mrs. O'Dowd crying her eyes out with her eight inches of fat all over her. Couldn't loosen her farting strings, but old Cod's eye was waltzing around her, showing her how to do it. What's your program today? I, humane methods. Because the poor animals suffer, and experts say, and the best known remedy that doesn't cause pain to the animal, and on the sore spot, administer gently. Gob. He'd have a soft hand under a hen. Gaga gara, cluck, cluck, cluck. Black Liz is our hen. She lays eggs for us. When she lays her eggs, she is so glad. Gara, cluck, cluck, cluck. Then comes good old Uncle Leo. He puts his hand under Black Liz and takes a fresh egg. Gaga gaga gara, cluck, cluck, cluck. Anyhow, says Joe, Field and Nanetti are going over tonight to London to ask about it on the floor of the House of Commons. Are you sure, says Bloom, the councillor is going? I wanted to see him as it happens. Well, he's going off by the mail boat, says Joe, tonight. That's too bad, says Bloom. I wanted particularly. Perhaps only Mr. Field is going. I couldn't phone. No. You're sure? Nanan's going too, says Joe. The League told him to ask a question tomorrow about the Commissioner of Police forbidding Irish games in the park. What do you think of that, citizen? The Sluan Naharian. 
Mr. Coconacre, Multifarnum, Nat. Arising out of the question of my honourable friend, the member for Shillag, may I ask the right honourable gentleman whether the government has issued orders that these animals shall be slaughtered, though no medical evidence is forthcoming as to their pathological condition? Mr. All Fours, Tamashant Count. Honourable members are already in possession of the evidence produced before a committee of the whole house. I feel I cannot usefully add anything to that. The answer to the honourable member's question is in the affirmative. Mr. O'Reilly O'Reilly, Montnutty Nut. Have similar orders been issued for the slaughter of human animals who dare to play the Irish games in the Phoenix Park? Mr. All Fours. The answer is in the negative. Mr. Coconac. Has the right honourable gentleman's famous Mitchellstown telegram inspired the policy of gentlemen on the Treasury bench? Oh, oh! Mr. All Fours. I must have notice of that question. Mr. Stalewit. Buncombe Ind. Don't hesitate to shoot. Ironical opposition cheers. The Speaker. Order! Order! The House rises. Cheers! There's the man, says Joe, that made the Gaelic sports revival. There he is, sitting there. The man that got away James Stephens. The champion of all Ireland at putting the sixteen-pound shot. What was your best throw, citizen? Now, Berkeley's, says the citizen, letting on to be modest. There was a time I was good as the next fellow anyhow. Put it there, citizen, says Joe. You were in a bloody sight better. It's not really a fact, says Alf. Yes, says Bloom, that's well known. Did you not know that? So, off they started about Irish sports and shining games and the like of lawn tennis and about Hurley and putting the stone and racy of the soil and building up as nation once again and all to that. And of course, Bloom had to have his say too about it, for fellow had a rower's heart, violent exercise was barred. I declare to my auntie Macarasa, if you look up at a straw from the bloody floor, and if you said to Bloom, look at Bloom, do you see that straw? That's a straw. Declare to my aunt he'd talk about it for an hour or so, and he would talk steady. A most interesting discussion took place in the ancient hall of Brian O'Sarnins in Shredna Britain Bieg, under the auspices of Slugnarenen, on the revival of ancient Gaelic sports and the importance of physical culture, as understood in ancient Greece and ancient Rome and ancient Ireland, for the development of the race. The venerable president of the noble order was in the chair, and the attendance was of large dimensions. After an instructive discourse by the chairman, a magnificent oration eloquently and forcibly expressed, a most interesting and instructive discussion of the usual high standard of excellence ensued as to the desirability of the revivability of the ancient games and sports of our ancient pan-Celtic forefathers. The well-known and highly respected worker in the cause of our old tongue, Mr. Joseph McCarthy Hines, made an eloquent appeal for the resuscitation of the ancient Gaelic sports and pastimes, practised morning and evening by Finn McCool, as calculated to revive the best traditions of manly strength and prowess handed down to us from the ancient ages. L. Bloom, who met with 
a mixed reception of applause and hisses, having espoused the negative, the vocalist chairman, brought the discussion to a close. In response to repeated requests and hearty plaudits from all parts of a bumper house, by a remarkably noteworthy rendering of the immortal Thomas Osborne Davis's evergreen verses, happily too familiar to need recalling here. A nation once again in the execution of which the veteran patriot champion may be said without fear of contradiction to have fairly excelled himself. The Irish Caruso Garibaldi was in superlative form, and his stentorian notes were heard to the greatest advantage in the time-honoured anthem sung as only our citizen can sing it. His superb high-class vocalism, which by its super-quality greatly enhanced his already international reputation, was vociferously applauded by the large audience, among which were to be noticed many prominent members of the clergy, as well as representatives of the press and the bar and the other learned professions. The proceedings then terminated. Amongst the clergy present were the very revered William Delany, S.J. L.L.D., the Rett Rev. Gerald Molloy, D.D., the Rev. P.J. Cavana, C.S.S.P., the Rev. T. Walters, C.C., the Rev. John M. Ivers, P.P., the Rev. P.J. Cleary, O.S.F., the Rev. L.J. Hickey, O.P., the very Rev. Fr. Nicholas, O.S.F.C., the very Rev. B. Gorman, O.D.C., the Rev. T. Mayer, S.J., the very Rev. James Murphy, S.J., the Rev. John Lavery, V.F., the very Rev. William Doherty, D.D., the Rev. Peter Fagan, O.M., the Rev. T. Brangan, O.S.A., the Rev. J. Flavin, C.C., the Rev. M. A. Hackett, C.C., the Rev. W. Hurley, C.C., the Right Rev. Manager McManus, V.G., the Rev. B. R. Statterley, O.M.I., the Very Rev. M. D. Scully, P.P., the Rev. F. T. Purcell, O.P., the Very Rev. Timothy Cannon Gorman, P.P., the Rev. J. Flanagan, C.C., the Laity included P. Fay, T. Quirk, etc., etc. Talking about violent exercise, says Alf, were you at that Co. Bennett match? No, says Joe. I heard so and so made a cool hundred quid over it, says Alf. Who? Blazes, says Joe. And says Bloom. What I meant about tennis, for example, is the agility and training the eye. Aye, Blazes, says Alf. He let out that Milo was on the beer to run up the odds and swatting it all the time. We know him, says the citizen, the traitor's son. We know what put English gold in his pocket. True for you, says Joe. And Bloom cuts in again about lawn tennis and the circulation of the blood, asking Alf, Now, don't you think, Bergen? Milo dusted the floor with him, says Alf. Heenan and Sayers was only a bloody fool to it. Handed him the father and mother of a beating. See the little kipper not up to his navel and the big fellow swiping. God, he gave him that one last puck in the wind, Queensbury rules and all. Made him puke what he never ate. It was a historic and a hefty battle when Myler and Percy were scheduled to don the gloves for the purse of fifty sovereigns. Handicapped as he was by lack of poundage, Dublin's pet lamb made up for it by its superlative skill in ring-craft. The final bout of fireworks was a gruelling for both champions. The welterweight Sergeant Major had tapped some lively claret in the previous mix-up, during which Co. had been oh, received general of right and lefts. 
the artilleryman putting in some neat work on the pet's nose, and Myla came on looking groggy. The soldier got to business, leading off with a powerful left jab, to which the Irish gladiator retaliated by shooting out a little stiff one flush to the point of Bennett's jaw. The redcoat ducked, but the Dubliner lifted him with a left hook, the body punch being a fine one. The men came to handy grips. Myla quickly became busy and got his man under, the bout ending with the bulkier man on the ropes, Myla punishing him. The Englishman, whose right eye was nearly closed, took his corner where he was liberally drenched with water, and when the bell went came on gamey and brimful of pluck, confident of knocking out the fistic uh, uh, eblonite in jig time. It was a fight to a finish, and the best man for it. The two fought like tigers, and excitement ran fever-high. The referee twice cautioned Pucking Percy for holding, but the pet was tricky and his footwork is a treat to watch. After a brisk exchange of courtesies, during which a smart upper cut of the military man brought blood freely from his opponent's mouth, the lamb suddenly waded in all over his man and landed a terrific left to battling Bennett's stomach, flooring him flat. It was a knockout clean and clever. Amid tense expectation, the portobello bruiser was being counted out when Bennett's second old thoughts wet steamed through in the towel, and the satry boy was declared victor to the frenzied cheers of the public, who broke through the ring ropes and fairly mobbed him with delight. "'He knows which side his bread is buttered,' says Alf. "'I hear he's running a concert tour now up in the north.' "'He is,' says Joe. "'Is he?' "'Who?' says Bloom. "'Ah, yes, that's quite true. "'Yes, a kind of summer tour, you see. "'Just a holiday.' "'Mrs. B is the bright particular star, isn't she?" says Joe. "'My wife?' says Bloom. "'She's singing, yes. I think it will be a success, too.' "'He's an excellent man to organise. Excellent.' "'Ho, ho, be gob, says I to myself, says I. That explains the milk in the coconut and absence of hair in the animal's chest. Blaze is doing the tootle on the flute. Concert tour. Dirty down the Dodgers, son. Off Island Bridge. That sold the same horses twice over to the government to fight the Boers. Old what-what. I called about the poor and water rate, Mr. Boylan. You what? The water rate, Mr. Boylan. You what-what? That's the bucko that'll organise her, take my lip. Twixt me and you, Caderish. Pride of Calpy's Rocky Mount, the raven-haired daughter of Tweedy. There grew she to peerless beauty, where Loquat and Almond sent the air. The gardens of Alameda knew her step. The garths of olives knew and bowed, the chaste spouse of Leopold is she, Marion of the bountiful bosoms. And lo, there entered one of the clan of the Omoloys, a comely hero of white face, yet with all some wrought ruddy, his majesty's counsel learned in the law, and with him the prince and heir of the noble line of Lambert. Lo, Ned! Hello, Alf. Hello, Jack. Hello, Joe. God save you, says the citizen. Save you kindly, says JJ. What'll it be, Nate? Half worn, says Nate. So, JJ ordered the drinks. Were you round at the court, says Joe? Yes, says JJ. He'll square that, Ned, says he. Hope so, says Nate. Now, what were those two at? J.J. getting him off the grand jury list, and the other giving him a leg over the steel. With his name in Stubbs, 
playing cards, hobnobbing with flash tops with a swank glass in their eye, a drinking fees, and he half smothered in writs and garnishy orders. Pawning his gold watch in commons of Francis Street, where no one would know him in the private office when I was there, with Pisser releasing his boots out the pop. What's your name, sir? Don, says he. Aye, and Don, says I. Gob, you'll come home by weeping cross one of these days, I'm thinking. Did you see that bloody lunatic bringing round there, says Alf? U. P. Up. <coughs> yes, says J. J., looking for a private detective. Aye, says Nade, and he wanted right to go wrong to address the court, only Corny Kelleher got round to telling him to get the handwriting examined first. Ten thousand pounds, says Alf, laughing. God, I'd give anything to hear him before a judge and jury. Was it you did it, Alf, says Joe. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you, Jimmy Johnson. Me, says Alf, don't cast your nasturtiums on my character. Whatever statement you make, says Joe, will be taken down in evidence against you. Of course, an action would lie, says J.J. It implies that he is not compost metis. You, P. Up. Compost your eyes, says Alf, laughing. Do you know that he's balmy? Look at his head. Do you know that some mornings he has to get his hat on with a shoehorn? Yes, says J.J., but the truth of a libel is no defence to an indictment for publishing it in the eyes of the law. Ha, ha, Alf, says Joe. Still, says Bloom, on account of the poor woman, I mean his wife. Pity about her, says the citizen, or any other woman marries a half and half. How half and half, says Bloom. Do you mean he? Half and half, I mean, says the citizen. A fellow that's neither fish nor flesh. No good red herring, says Joe. That's what I mean, says the citizen. A peshog, if you know what that is. Begob, I saw there was trouble coming and Bloom explaining he met on account of it being cruel for the wife having to go round after the old stuttering fool. Cruelty to animals, so it is, to let that bloody poverty-stricken Breen out on grass with his beard out tripping him, bringing down the rain. And she with her nose cock a hoop after she married him because a cousin of his old fellow's was pewopin' her to the Pope picture of him on the wall with his smash all Sweeney's moustaches, the Signor Brini from Summerhill, the Italiano, Papal Zuave to the Holy Father, has left the quay and gone to Moss Street. And who was he, tell us? A nobody. Two pair back and passages at seven shillings a week, and he covered with all sorts of breastplates, bidding defiance to the world. And moreover, says J.J., a postcard is publication. It was held to be sufficient evidence of malice in the test case Sadgrove v. Hole. In my opinion, an action might lie. Six and eight pints, please. Who wants your opinion? Let us drink our pints in peace. God won't even let do that much himself. Well, good health, Jack, says Nate. Good health, Nade, says J.J. There he is again, says Joe. Where, says Alf. And begob, there he was, passing the door with his books under his oxter and the wife beside him and Corny Kelleher with his wool eye looking in as they went past talking to him like a father, trying to sell him a second-hand coffin. Remanded, says J.J. 
one of the bottlenosed fraternity it was went by the name of james watt alias Safiro, alias spark and spiro put an ad in the papers saying he'd give a passage to canada for twenty bob what do you see any green in the white of my eye course it was a bloody barney what swindled them all skivvies and badhacks from the county mirth ay and his own kidney too j j was telling us there was an ancient hebrew zaretsky or something weeping in the witness box with his hat on him swearing by the holy moses he was stuck for two quid who tried the case said joe recorder said ned poor old sir frederick says alf you can cord him up to the last two eyes heart as big as a lion says ned tell him a tale of woe about arrears of rent and a sick wife and a squad of kids and faith he'll dissolve in tears on the bench ay ay says alf Reuben J was bloody lucky he didn't clap him in the dock the other day for suing poor little Gumley that's minding stones for the corporation there near Butt Bridge. And he starts taking off the old recorder, letting on to cry. A most scandalous thing, this poor hard-working man. How many children? Ten, did you say? Yes, your worship, and my wife has the typhoid. And the wife with typhoid fever, scandalous. Leave the court immediately, sir. No, sir, I'll make no order for payment. How dare you, sir, come up before me and ask me to make an order? A poor, hard-working, industrious man. I dismiss the case. And whereas, on the sixteenth day of the month of the Oxide Goddess, and in the third week after the feast day of the Holy and Undivided Trinity, the daughter of the skies, the virgin moon, being then in her first quarter, it came to pass that those learned judges repaired them to the halls of law. There, Master Courtney, sitting in his own chamber, gave him Reed and Master Justice Andrews, sitting without a jury of the probate court, weighed well and pondered the claim of the first charge and upon the property in the manner of the will propounded and the final testamentary disposition in re the real and personal estate of the late lamented Jacob Halliday, Winter, deceased versus Livingstone, an infant of unsound mind and another and to the solemn court of green street there came sir frederick the falconer and he sat in there about the hour of five o'clock to administer the law of the brians at the commission for all that and those parts to be holding in and for the county of the city of dublin and there sat with him the high Sindrahim of the twelve tribes of La, for every tribe one man, of the tribe of Patrick, and of the tribe of Hugh, and of the tribe of Owen, and of the tribe of Con, and of the tribe of Oscar, and of the tribe of Fergus, and of the tribe of Finn, and of the tribe of Dermot, and of the tribe of Cormac, and of the tribe of Kevin, and of the tribe of Caelet, and of the tribe of Ossian. There being in all twelve good men, and true. And he conjured them by him who died on rude, they should well and truly try to true deliverance make in that issue, joined between their sovereign lord, the king and the prisoner at the bar, and true verdict give according to the evidence, so help them God, and kiss the book. And they rose in their seats, those twelve of law, and they swore by the name of him who is from everlasting, that they would do his right wiseness. And straight away the minions of the law led forth from their donjon keep, one whom the sleuth hounds of justice had apprehended in consequence of information received. And they shackled him hard and hand and foot, and would take of him the bail, the main trees, but preferred a charge against him, for he was a malefactor. 
"'Those are nice things,' said the citizen, coming over here to Ireland, filling the country with bugs. So Bloom lets on he heard nothing, and he starts talking with Joe, telling him he needn't trouble about that little matter till the first, but if he would just say a word to Mr. Crawford. And so Joe swore high and holy by this, and by that he'd do the devil and all. "'Because, you see,' says Bloom, "'for an advertisement you must have repetition. "'That's the whole secret.' "'Rely on me,' says Joe. "'Swindling the peasants,' says the citizen, "'and the poor of Ireland. "'We want no more strangers in our house.' "'Oh, I'm sure that will be all right, Hines,' says Bloom. It's just that keys, you see. Consider that done, says Joe. Very kind of you, says Bloom. The strangers, says the citizen. Our own fault. We let them come in. We brought them in. The adulteress and her paramour brought the Saxon robbers here. Decree Nisi, says J.J. And Bloom, letting on to be awfully deeply interested in nothing, a spider's web in the corner behind the barrel, and the citizen scowling after him, and the old dog at his feet looking up to know who to bite and when. A dishonoured wife, says the citizen, that's what the cause of our were misfortunes. And here she is, says Alf that was giggling over the police gazette with Terry on the counter in all her war paint. Give us a squint at her, says I. And what was it only one of the smutty Yankee pictures Terry borrows off of Corny Kelleher? Secrets for enlarging your private parts. Misconduct of Society Bell. Norman W. Tupper wealthy Chicago contractor, finds pretty but faithless wife in lap of Officer Taylor. Belle in her bloomers misconducting herself, and her fancy man feeling for her tickles, and Norman W. Tupper bouncing in with his pea-shooter just in time to be lit after she doing the trick of the loop with Officer Taylor. No, oh, Jake is, Jenny, says Joe. How short your skirt is. There's hair, Joe, says I. Get a queer old tail end of corned beef off of that one, what? So anyway, in came John Wise Noland and Lenehan with him, with a face on him as long as a late breakfast. Well, says the citizen, what's the latest from the scene of action? What did those tinkers in the city hall at their caucus meeting decide about the Irish language? Oh, no, Lynn, clad in shining armour, low bending, made obeisance to the puissant and high and mighty chief of all Erin, and did him to wit of that which had befallen how that gr the grave elders of the most obedient city, second of the realm, had met them in the hostel, and there, after due prayers to the gods who dwell in either supernal, had taken solemn counsel whereby they might, if so be it might be, bring once more into honour among mortal men the winged speech of the sea-divided gale. It's on the march, says the citizen. To hell with the bloody brutal Sernax and their patois. So, J.J. puts in a word. Doing the tough about one story was good till you heard another and blinking fox and the Nelson policy, putting your blind eye to the telescope and drawing up a bill and attainer to impeach a nation. And Bloom trying to back him up moderation and botheration and their colonies and their civilization. The civilization, you mean, says the citizen. To hell with them. 
the curse of a good-for-nothing god light sideways on the bloody thick lugged sons of whores gets no music and no art and no literature worthy of the name any civilization they have stole from us tongue-tied sons of bastards ghosts the european family says j j they're no european says the citizen i was in europe with kevin egan of paris you wouldn't see a trace of them all their language anywhere in europe except in a cabinet de sens and says john wise full many a flower is born to blush unseen and says lenehan that knows a bit of the lingo conspuez les anglaises perfide abion he said and then lifted he in his rude great brawny strengthy hands the medher of dark foamy ale and uttering his tribal slogan lam dieg abu he drank to the undoing of his foes a race of mighty valorous heroes rulers of the waves who sit on thrones of alabaster silent as the deathless gods what's up with you says i to lenehan you look like a fellow that had lost a bob and found a tanner gold cop says he who won mr lenehan says terry throw away says he at twenty to one a rank outsider and the rest nowhere and buses ma says terry still running says he we're all in a cart boylan plunged too queer on my tip sceptre for himself and a lady friend i had half a crown myself says terry on zinfandel that mr flynn gave me lord howard de walden's twenty to one says lenehan such is life in an outhouse throw away says he takes the biscuit and talking about bunions frailty thy name is sceptre so he went over to the biscuit tin bob durren left to see if there was anything he could lift on the nod the old cur after him backing his look with his mangy snout up old mother hubbard went to the cupboard not there my child says he keep your pecker up says joe she'd have won the money only for the other dog and j j and the citizen arguing about law and history with bloom sticking in an old word some people says bloom can see the mole in others eyes but they can't see the beam in their own Ryamice, says the citizen, there's n no one as blind as the fellow that won't see, if you know what that means. Where are our missing twenty millions of Irish should be here today instead of four, our lost tribes? And our potteries and textiles, the finest in the whole world. And our wool that was sold in Rome in the time of Juvenal, and our flax and our damask from the looms of Antrim, and our limerick lace, our tanneries, and our white flint glass down there by Ballybar, and our Huguenot poplin that we have sent, Jacquard de Lyon, and our woven silk, and our foxford tweeds, and ivory raised point from the Camelite convent in New Ross, nothing like it in the whole wide world where are the greek merchants that came through the pillars of hercules the gibraltar now grabbed by the foe of mankind with gold and tyrian purple to sell in wexford at the fair of carmen read tacitus and ptolemy even gerardus cambrensis wine peltries connemara marble silver from tipperary second to none our far-famed horses even today the irish hobbies with king philip of spain offering to pay customs duties for the right to fish in our waters what do the yellow johns of anglia owe us for our ruined trade and our ruined hearths 
and the beds of the barrow and shannon they won't deepen with millions of acres of marsh and bog to make us all die of consumption as treeless as portugal we'll be soon says john wise or heliolant with its one tree if something is not done to reforest the land larches firs all the trees of the conifer family are going fast i was reading a report of lord castleton's save them says the citizen the giant ash of galway and the chieftain elm of kildare with a forty-foot bull and an acre of foliage Serve the trees of Ireland for the future men of Ireland on the far hills of Ire. Oh! Europe has its eyes on you, says Lenehan. The fashionable international world attended en masse this afternoon at the wedding of the Chevalier Jean Weiss de Nolin, Grand High Chief Ranger of the Irish National Foresters, with Miss Fur Conifer of Pine Valley. Lady Sylvester Elmshade, Mrs. Barbara Love Birch, Mrs. Paul Ash, Mrs. Holly Hazel Eyes, Mrs. Daphne Bears, Miss Dorothy Cairnbrake, Mrs. Clyde Twelve Trees, Mrs. Rowan Green, Mrs. Helen Vingadding, Vin Miss Virginia Creeper, Miss Gladys Beach, Miss Olive Garth, Miss Blanche Maple, Miss Maud Montgomery, Miss Mira Myrtle, Miss Priscilla Elderflower, Miss B. Honeysuckle, Miss Grace Poplar, Miss Omimosa San, Miss Rachel Cedarfrond, the Misses Lillian and Viola Lilac, Miss Timidity Aspinall, Miss Kitty Dewey Moss, Miss May Hawthorne, Mrs. Gloriana Palm, Mrs. Liana Forrest, Mrs. Arabella Blackwood and Mrs. Norma Holyoke of Oak Home Regis graced the ceremony by their presence. The bride, who was given away by her father, the McConifer of the Glands, looked exquisitely charming in a creation carried out in green mercerized silk, moulded on an underslip of gloaming grey, sashed with a yoke of broad emerald and finished with a triple flat of darker-hued fringe, the scheme being relieved by bretelles and hip insertions of acorn bronze. The maids of honour, Miss Larch Conifer and Miss Spruce Conifer, sisters of the bride, wore very becoming costumes in the same tone, a dainty motif of plume rose being worked into the pleats in a pinstripe and repeated capriciously in the jade-green turks in the form of heron feathers of palatine coral. The Senor Enrique Flor presided at the organ with his well-known ability and, in addition to the prescribed numbers of the nuptial mass, played a new and striking arrangement of Woodman Spare That Tree at the conclusion of the service. On leaving the church of St. Fiacre in Horto, after the papal blessing, the happy pair were subjected to a playful crossfire of hazelnuts, beech mast, bay leaves, catskins of willow, ivy toad, hollyberries, mistletoe springs, and quicken shoots. Mr. and Mrs. Wise at Conifer Newland will spend a quiet honeymoon in the Black Forest. And our eyes are on Europe, says the citizen. We had our trade with Spain and the French and the Flemings before these mongrels were pupped. Spanish Isle and Galway, the wine bark on the wine dark waterway. And will again, says Joe. And with the help of the Holy Mother of God we will again, says the citizen, clapping his thigh. Our harbours that are empty will be full again. Queenstown, Kinsale, Galway, Blacksword Bay, Ventry in the Kingdom of Kerry, Killybegs, the third largest harbour in the wide world, with a fleet of masts, and the Galway Liches, and the Cavern of Rileys, and the O Kennedys of Dublin, when the Earl of Desmond could make a treaty with the Emperor Charles V himself. And... Will again, says he, when the first Irish battleship is seen breasting the waves with our own flag to the fore. None of your Henry Tudor's harps, no. The oldest flag afloat, 
the flag of the province of Desmond and Thomond, three crowns on a blue field, the three sons of Milesius. And he took the last swig out of the pint. Moya, all wind and piss like a tanyard cat. Cows and Connacht have long horns, as much as his bloody life is worth to go down and address his tall talk to the assembled multitude in Shanna Golden, where he daren't show his nose with the Molly Maguires looking for him to let daylight through him for grabbing the holding of an evicted tenant. Hear, hear to that, says John Wise. What we have? An imperial yeomanry, says Lenehan, to celebrate the occasion. Half one, Terry, says John Wise, and a hands up. Terry, are you asleep? Yes, sir, says Terry. Small whisky and bottle of alsop, right, sir. Handing over the bloody paper with Alf looking for spicy bits instead of attending to the general public. Picture of a butting match. Trying to crack their bloody schools, one chap going for the other with his head down like a bull at a gate. And another one. Black beast burned in Omaha, Georgia. No, Omaha, G.A. <laughs> a lot of Deadwood Dicks in slouch hats, and they're firing at a Sambo strung up in a tree with his tongue out and a buff fire under him. Gob, they ought to drown in, in the sea and electrocute and crucify him to make sure of their job. But what about the fighting navy, says Ned, that keeps our foes at bay? I'll tell you about it, says the citizen. Hell upon earth it is. Read the revelations that's going on in the papers about flogging on the training ships at Portsmouth. A fellow writes that calls himself Disgusted One. So he starts telling us about corporal punishment, and about the crew of tars and officers, and re a rad morals drawn up in cocked hats, and the parson with his Protestant Bible to witness punishment, and a young lad brought out, howling for his ma, as they tie him down on the butt end of a gun. A romp and dozen, says the citizen. What was that old ruffian Sir John Beresford called it, but the modern gods Englishman calls it? caning on the breach. And says John Wise, "'Tis a custom move honoured in the breach than in the observance." Then he was telling us the master at arms comes along with a long cane, and he draws out, and he flogs the bloody backside of the poor lad till he yells me a murder. "'That's your glorious British navy.' says the citizen, that bosses the earth. The fellow that never will be slaves with the only hereditary chamber on the face of God's earth, and their land in the hands of a dozen game hogs and cotton ball barons. That's the great empire they boast about, of drudges and whipped serfs. On which the sun never rises, says Joan. And the tragedy of it, says the citizen, they believe it. The unfortunate yahoos believe it. They believe in Rod, the scourger almighty, creator of hell upon earth, and in Jackie Tar, the son of a gun, who was conceived of holy boast, born of the fighting navy, suffered under rump and dozen, was scarified, flayed and curried, yelled like bloody hell. The third day he rose again from the bed, steered into heaven, sitteth on his beam and, till further orders whence he shall come to drudge for a living and be paid. But, says Bloom, isn't discipline the same everywhere? I mean, wouldn't it be the same here if you put force against force? Didn't I tell you, as true as I'm drinking this porter, if he was at his last gasp, he'd try to downface you that dying was living. We'll put force against force, says the citizen. We have our greater island beyond the sea. They were driven out of house and home in the black forty-seven. 
their mud cabins and their sheelings by the road were laid down low by the battering ram and the times rubbed its hands and told the white-livered saxons there would soon be as few irish in ireland as the redskins in america even the grand turk sent us his pastries but the sacknock tribe to starve the nation at home while the land was full of crops that the british hyenas bought and sold in rio de janeiro ay they drove out the peasants in hordes twenty thousand of them died in the coffin shops but those that came to the land of the free remember the land of bondage and they will come again and with a vengeance no cravens the sons of granai the champions of kathleen and houlihan perfectly true says bloom but my point was we are a long time waiting for that day citizen says ned since the poor old women told us that the french were on the sea and landed at calaya ay says john wise we fought for the royal stuarts that reneged us against the willamites that betrayed us remember limerick and the broken treaty stone we gave our best blood to france and spain the wild geese fontenoy eh and sarsfield and o'donnell duke of tetuan in spain and ulysses brown of camus that was field marshal to maria theresa but what did we ever get for it the french says the citizen set of dancing masters do you know what it is they were never worth a roasted fart to ireland aren't they trying to make an entente cordiale now at tepe's dinner party with perfidious albion firebrands of europe and they always were conspoir les francais says lenehan nobbing his beer and as for the prussians and the hanoverians says joe haven't we had enough of those sausage-eating bastards on the throne from george the elector down to the german lad and the flatulent old bitch that's dead jesus i had to laugh at the way he came out with that about the old one with the winkers on her blind drunk in a royal palace every night of god old vic with her jorum of mountain dew and her coachman carting her up body and bones to roll into bed and she pulling him by the whiskers and singing upon him old bits of songs about erin on the rhine and come where the booze is cheaper well says j j we have edward the peacemaker now tell that to a fool says the citizen there's a bloody sight more pox than pox about that boy o oh. edward gulfwettin and what do you think says joe of the holy boys the priests and the bishops of ireland doing up his room in maynooth his satanic majesty's racing colours and sticking up pictures of all the horses his jockeys rode the earl of dublin no less they ought to have stuck up all the women he rode himself says little alf and says dear dear considerations of space influenced their lordship's decision will you try another citizen says joe yes sir says he i will you says joe beholden to you joe says i may your shadow never grow less repeat that dose says joe bloom was talking and talking with john wise and he quite excited with his dunducketty mud-coloured mug on him and his old plume eyes rolling about persecution says he all the history of the world is full of it perpetuating national hatred among nations but do you know what a nation means says john wise yes says bloom what is it says john wise a nation says bloom a nation is the same people living in the same place by god then says ned laughing if that's so i'm a nation for i'm living in the same place for the past five years so of course everyone had the laugh at bloom and says he trying to muck out of it or also living in different places that covers my case says joe 
What is your nation, if I might ask? says the citizen. Ireland, says Bloom. I was born here. Ireland. The citizen said nothing, only cleared the spit out of his gullet, and, gob, he spat a red bank oyster out of him right in the corner. After you with the push, Joe, says he, taking out his handkerchief to swab himself dry. Here you are, citizen, says Joe. Take that in your right hand and repeat after me the following words. The much-treasured and intricately embroidered ancient Irish face cloth attributed to Solomon of Droma and Manus Ptolemach of MacDonald, authors of the Book of Ballymoot, was then carefully produced and called forth prolonged admiration. No need to dwell on the legendary beauty of the corner pieces, the acme of art, wherein one can distinctly discern each of the four evangelists in turn, presenting to each of the four masters his evangelical symbol, a bogux scepter, a North American puma, a far nobler creature of beasts than the British article, be it said in passing, a caricaf and a golden eagle from Carantwill. The scenes depicted on the amunctory field, showing our ancient duns and rathes and comlex and greenews and seats of learning and maledictive stories, are as wondrously beautiful, and the pigments as delicate as when the Sligo illuminators gave rein to their artistic fantasy long, long ago in the time of the Barmenicles. Glendalough, the lovely licks of Killarney, the ruins of Clonmacnoise, Clong Abbey, Glenarg and the Twelve Pins, Ireland's Eye, the green hills of Talact, Cloak Patrick, the brewery of Messrs. Arthur Guinness, Sons and Company, Limited, Lownese Banks, the Vale of Avoca, Isolde's Tower, the Mapus Obelisk, Sir Patrick Dunn's Hospital, Cape Clear, the Glen of Eyehow, Lynch's Castle, the Scotch House, Rathow Union Workhouse at Lowestown, Tullamore Jail, Castle Connell Rapids, Kilbally Marchenhall, the Cross at Monasterboice, Jury's Hotel, St. Patrick's Purgatory, the Salmon Leap, Maynooth College Refectory, Curly's Hole, the Three Birthplaces of the First Duke of Wellington, the Rock of Cashel, the Borg of Allen, the Henry Street Warehouse, Fingal's Cave. All these moving scenes are still there for us today, rendered more beautiful still by the waters of sorrow which have passed over them, and by the rich incrustations of time. Show us over the drink, says I. Which is which? That's mine, says Joe, as the devil said to the dead policeman. And I belong to a race, too, says Bloom, that is hated and persecuted. Also now, this very moment, this very instant. Gorby near burnt his fingers with the butt of his old cigar. Robbed, says he. Plundered, insulted, persecuted, taking what belongs to us by right. At this very moment, says he, putting up his fist, sold by auction in Morocco like slaves or cattle. Are you talking about New Jerusalem? says the citizen. I'm talking about injustice, says Bloom. Right, says John Weiss. Stand up to it then with force like men. That's an almanac picture for you. Mark for a soft-nosed bullet. Old lardy face standing up to the business end of a gun. Gob, he'd adorn a sweeping brush, so he would, if only he had a nurse's apron on him. And then he collapses all of a sudden, twisting around all the opposite, as limp as a wet rag. But it's no use, says he. Force, history, history, all that. There's not life for men and women, insult and hatred. And everybody knows that it's the very opposite of that, that is really life. What, says Alf? Love, says Bloom. I mean the opposite of hatred. I must go now, he says to John Wise, just round to a court a moment to see if Martin is there. 
If he comes, just say I'll be back in a second. Just a moment. Who's hindering you? And off he pops like greased lightning. A new apostle to the Gentiles, says the citizen. Universal love. Well, says John Wise, isn't that what we are told? Love your neighbour? That chap, says the citizen. Beggar my number is his motto. Love Moya, he's a nice pattern of a Romeo and Juliet. Love loves to love love. Nurse loves the new chemist. Constable Fortinet loves Mary Kelly. Gertie McDowell loves the boy that has the bicycle. M.B. loves the fair gentleman. Lee Chan Han lovey up kissy cha poo chow. Jumbo the elephant loves Alice the elephant. Old Mr. Vershoyle with the ear trumpet loves old Mrs. Vershoyle with the turned in eye. The man in the brown mackintosh loves a lady who is date. His Majesty the King loves Her Majesty the Queen. Mrs. Norman W. Tupper loves Officer Taylor. You love a certain person, and this person loves that other person because everybody loves somebody, but God loves everybody. Well, Joe, says I, your very good health and song. More power, citizen. Hurrah there, says Joe. The blessing of God and Mary and Patrick on you, says the citizen. And he ups with his pint to wet his whistle. We know those canters, says he, preaching and picking your pocket. What about sanctimonious Cromwell and his iron sides that put the women and children of Drogheda to the sword with the Bible text, God is love, pasted round the mouth of his cannon? Bible. Did you read that skit in the United Irishman today about that Zulu chief that's visiting England? What's that? says Joe. So the citizen takes up one of his paraphernalia papers and he starts reading out. A delegation of the chief cotton magnates of Manchester was presented yesterday to his majesty the Alakai of Albuquerque Cooter in gold stick in waiting. Lord Walkup of Walkup the Eggs walk up on eggs to tender to his majesty the heartfelt thanks of british traders for the facilities afforded them in his dominions the delegation partook of luncheon at the conclusion of which the dusky potentate in the course of a happy speech freely translated by the british chap chaplain the reverend ananias praise god bare bones tendered his best thanks to massa walk up and emphasized the cordial relations existing between Abiquita and the British Empire, stating that he treasured as one of his dearest possessions an illuminated Bible, the volume of the Word of God, and the secret of England's greatness, graciously presented to him by the white chief woman, the great squaw Victoria, with a personal dedication from the august hand of the royal donor. The Alakai then drank a loving cup of fist-shot usebuck to the toast black and white from the skull of his immediate predecessor in the dynasty Kakatachak. <laughs> skull of his uh, surnamed Forty Wart, after which he visited the chief factory of Cottonopolis and signed his mark in the visitor's book, subsequently executing a charming old acubutic wardens, in the course of which he swallowed several knives and forks, amid hilarious applause from the girl Hans. Widow woman, says Nate. I wouldn't doubt her. Wonder did he put that Bible to the same use as I would. Same, only more so, says Linehan. And thereafter, in that fruitful land, the broad-leaved mango flourished exceedingly. Is that by Griffith? says John Wise. No, says the citizen. It's not signed Shagatna. It's only initialed. P. And a 
very good initial, too, says Joe. That's how it worked, said the citizen. Trade follows the flag. Well, says J.J., if they're any worse than those Belgians in the Congo Free State, they must be bad. Did you read that report by a man what's his name is? Casement, says the citizen. He's an Irishman. Yes, that's the man, says J.J., raping the women and girls and flogging the natives on the belly to squeeze all the red rubber they can out of them. I know where he's gone, says Lenehan, cracking his fingers. Who, says I? Bloom, says he. The courthouse is a blind. Here's a few bob on throw away, and he's gone to gather in the shekels. Is it that white-eyed kaffir, says the citizen, that never barked a horse in anger in his life? where he's gone, says Linehan. I met Bantam Lyons going to buck that horse, only I put him off it, and he told me Bloom gave him the tip. Bet you what you like, he has a hundred shillings to five on. He's the only man in Dublin, has it, a dark horse. He's a bloody dark horse himself, says Joe. Mind, Joe, says I. Show us the entrance out. There you are, says Terry. Goodbye, Ireland. I'm going to God. So I just went round the back of the yard to pump a ship and begob hundred shilling to five while I was letting off my throw away twenty two. Letting off my load, gob, I said to myself, I knew he was uneasy in his two pints off of Joe and one in Slattery's off. In his mind to get off the mark to hundred shillings is five quid. And when they were in that dark horse, Pisser Burke was telling me card plenty and letting on the child was sick. God must have done about a gallon. Flabby ass of a wife speaking down the tube. She's better or she's... Ow! All the plants so that he could vamoose with the pool if he won. Oh, jeez, full up I was, trading without a license. Ow! Ireland, my nation, says he, Hoik, thuk! Never be up to those bloody, that's the last of it, Jerusalem. Ah, cuckoos. So, anyhow, when I got back, they were at it, ding-dong, John Wise saying it was Bloom gave the ideas for St. Fine to Griffiths to put in his paper all kinds of gerrymandering, packed juries and swindling the taxes off of the government and appointing consuls all over the world to walk about selling Irish industries, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Gob, that puts the bloody kibosh on on it if old sloppy eyes is mucking up the show gives us a bloody chance god save ireland from the likes of that bloody mouse about mr bloom with his argo bargo and his old fellow before him perpetrating frauds old methuselah bloom the robbing bagman that poisoned himself with the prussic acid after He's swamping the country with his baubles and his penny diamonds, loaned by post on easy terms, any amount of money advanced on note of hand, distance, no object, no security, gob, he's like Lanty McHale's goat that'd go a piece on the road with every one. Well, it's a fact, says John Wise, and there's the man now that'll tell you all about it, Martin Cunningham. Sure enough, the castle car drove up with Martin on it, and Jack Power with him, and a fellow named Crofter, or Crofton, pensioner out of the Collector Generals, an orangeman Blackburn does have on the registration, and he drawing his pay, or Crawford gallivanting around the country at the King's expense. Our travellers reached the rustic hostelry and alighted from their palfreys. Oh, Varlet! he cried who by his mien seemed the leader of the party. Saucy nerve! To us! So saying, he knocked loudly with his sword-hilt upon the open lattice. 
Mein Hust came forth at the summons, girding him with his tabard. Give you good den, my masters, said he with an obsequious bow. Bestir thyself, sirrah, cried he who had knocked. Look to our steeds, and for ourselves give us of your best, for a faith we need it. Lack a day, good masters, said the host, my poor house has but a bare larder. I know not what to offer your lordships. How now, fellow, cries the second of the party, a man of pleasant countenance, so servest thou the king's messengers, Mr. Tapton. An instantaneous change overspread the landlord's visage. Cry you mercy, gentlemen, he said humbly. And you be the king's messengers. God shield his majesty. You shall not want for aught. The king's friends, God bless his majesty, shall not go a fasting in my house, I warrant me. Then about, cried the traveller, who had not spoken, a lusty treacherman by his aspect. How ought to give us? Mine host bowed again as he made answer. What say you, good masters, to a squab pigeon pastry, some collops of venison, a saddle of veal, widgeon with crisp hog's bacon, a boar's head with pistachios, a basin of jolly custard, a metier tansy, and a flagon of old Rhenish? God zooks, cried the last speaker, that likes me well. Pistachios? Aha, cried he of the pleasant countenance. A poor house and a bare larder, quoth a tis a merry rogue. So in comes Martin, asking where was Bloom. Where is he? says Lenehan, defrauding win widows and orphans. Isn't that a fact? says John Wise. What I was telling the citizen about Bloom and the Sinfone. That's so, said Martin, or so they allege. Who made those allegations? said Alf. I, says Joe, I'm the alligator. And after all, says John Wise, why can't a Jew love his country like the next fellow? Why not, says J.J., when he's quite sure which country it is? Is he a Jew, or a Gentile, or a Holy Roman, or a Swaddler, or what the hell is he, says Nade, or who is he? No offence, Crofton. Who is Junius, says J.J. We don't want him, says Crofter, the Orangeman of Presbyterian. He's a perverted Jew, says Martin, from a place in Hungary, and it was he drew up all the plans according to the Hungarian system. We know that in the castle. Isn't he a cousin of Bloom the Dentist? says Jack Power. Not at all, says Martin. Own the name six. His name was Virag, the father's name that poisoned himself. He changed it by deep pool, the father did. That's the new messiah for Ireland, says the citizen. Ireland of saints and sages. Well, they're still waiting for their redeemer, says Martin. For that matter, so are we. Yes, says J.J., and every male that's born, they think it may be their messiah. And every Jew is in a tall state of excitement, I believe, till he knows if he's a father or a mother. Expecting every moment will be his next, says Lenehan. Oh, by God, says Nate, you should have seen Bloom before that son of his that died was born. I met him one day in the South City markets, buying a tin of Neve's food six weeks before the wife was delivered. On vente sa mère, says J.J. J.J. <laughs> Do you call that a man? says the citizen. I wonder, did he ever put it out of sight? says Joe. Well, there were two children born anyhow, says Jack Power. And who does he suspect? says the children. 
gob there's many a true word spoken in jest one of those mixed middlings he is lying up in the hotel pisser was telling me once a month with headache like a tutty with her courses do you know what i'm telling you it'd be an act of god to take a hold of a fellow the like of that and throw him in the bloody sea justifiable homicide so it would then slopping off with his five quid without putting up a pint of stuff like a man give us your blessing not as much as would blind your eye charity to the neighbour says martin but where is he we can't wait wolf in sheep's clothing says the citizen that's what he is a virag from hungary ah swearis i call him cursed by god have you time for a brief libation martin says nate only one says martin we must be quick at j j and s you jack croft in three half ones terry st patrick would want to land again at ballykinlar and convert us says the citizen after allowing things like that to contaminate our shores well says martin rapping for his glass god bless all here is my prayer amen says the citizen and i'm sure he will says joe and at the sound of the sacred bell headed by a crucifer with acolytes thurifers boat bearers readers ostiari deacons and subdeacons the blessed company drew nigh of mitred abbots and priors and guardians and monks and friars the monks of benedict of Svotello, carthusians and carmodelesi cistercians and olivitians oratorians and valambrosians and the friars of augustine brigantines premonstratarians servi trinitarians and the children of peter nolasco and therewith from carmel mount the children of elijah prophet led by albert bishop and by teresa of avila calct and other and friars brown and grey sons of poor francis capuchins cordelias minimimes and observants and the daughters of clara and the sons of dominic the friars preachers and the sons of vincent and the monks of st wulston and ignatius his children and the confraternity of the christian brothers led by the reverend brother edmund ignatius rice and after came all saints and martyrs virgins and confessors saint seer and saint isidore arator and saint james the less and saint focus of sinope sinope and saint julian hospitator and saint felix de cantalice and saint simon stiltz and saint stephen protomater and saint john of god and saint ferro and saint lugard and saint the Theodotus and St. Vulman and St. Richard and St. Vincent of Paul and St. Martin of Todi and St. Martin of Tours and St. Alfred and St. Joseph and St. Denis and St. Cornelius and St. Leopold and St. Bernard and St. Terence and St. Edward and St. Owen Caniculus and St. Anonymous and St. Eponymous and St. Pseudonymous and St. Homonymous and St. Paronymous, and St. Synonymous, and St. Lawrence O'Toole, and St. James of Dingle, and Compostella, and St. Columcille, and St. Columba, and St. Celestine, and St. Coleman, and St. Kevin, and St. Brendan, and St. Fagidian, and St. Senan, and St. Facknan, and St. Columbanus, and St. Gaul, and St. Fursi, and St. Fitton, and St. Fuca, and St. Nepomuk, and St. Thomas Aquinas, and St. Ives of Brittany, and St. Mission, and St. Herman Joseph, and the three patrons of holy youth, St. Aloysius Gonzaga, and St. Stanislaus Kostka, and St. John Berkmans, and the Saints Gervasius, Servasius, and Bonifacius, and St. Bride, and St. Kiernan, and St. Canis of Kilkenny, and St. Jarleth of Tom, and St. Finbarn, and St. Papin of Ballymun, and Brother Aloysius Pacifus, and Brother Louis Bellicosis, and the Saints Rose of Lima, and of Viterbo, and St. Martyr of 
Bethany and St. Mary of Egypt and St. Lucy and St. Bridget and St. Attracta and St. Dimpna and St. Eta and St. Marian Calpensis and the Blessed Sister Teresa of the Child Jesus and St. Barbara and St. Scholastica and St. Ursula with eleven thousand virgins. And all came with nimby and orioles and gloriae bearing plumes and harps and swords and olive crowns in robes whereon were woven the blessed symbols of their efficacies ink horns arrows loaves cruces fetters axes trees bridges babes in a bathtub shells wallets shears keys dragons lilies buckshots beards hogs lamps bellows beehives soup ladles stars snakes anvils boxes of vaseline bells crutches forceps staghorns water-tight boots Hawks, millstones, eyes on a dish, wax candles, aspergils, unicorns, and as they wended their way by Nelson's Pillar, Henry Street, Murray Street, Capel Street, Little Britain Street, chanting the introit in Epiphania Domini, which beginneth a surge illuminare, and thereafter most sweetly the gradual omnes which saith de Saba Benyet did they diverse wonders such as casting out devils raising the dead to life multiplying fishes healing the halt and the blind discovering various articles which had been mislaid interpreting and fulfilling the scriptures blessing and prophesying and last beneath a canopy of cloth of gold came the reverend father o'flynn attended by malachi and patrick and when the good fathers had reached the appointed place, the house of Ben, uh, the house of Bernard Keenan and Company, Limited, eight, nine, and ten, Little Britain Street, wholesale grocers, wine and brandy shippers, licensed for the sale of beer, wine, and spirits for consumption on the premises, the celebrant blessed the house and sensed the moolly and windows and the groins and the vaults and the arises and the capitals and the pediments and the cornices and the engrailed arches and the spires and the cupolas and sprinkled the lintels thereof with blessed water and prayed that god might bless that house as he had blessed the house of abraham and isaac and jacob and make the angels of his light to inhabit therein and entering he blessed the viands and the beverages and the company of all the blessed answered his prayers. Adiutorium nostrum in nomine domini, qui felit colium et tarum, dominus vobiscum, et cum spiritu tuo. And he laid his hands upon that he blessed, and gave thanks, and he prayed and they all with him prayed. Deus, quius verbo sanctificante omnia, benedictionem tuam effundi super creaturas istas, et presta ut quisquis ex secundum legum et voluntatum, tuam cum gratiarum actione usus fuerit per invocationem sanctissimi nominus tui corporis santianum et anime tutelam ti octore per sipayat per Christum dominium nostrum. And so say all of this, says Jack. Thousand a year, Lambert, says Crofton or Crawford. Right, says Ned, taking up his John Jameson, and butter for fish. I was just looking around to see who the happy thought would strike, when be damned, but in he comes again, letting on to be in a hell of a hurry. I was just round at the courthouse, says he, looking for you. I hope I'm not. No, Martin says, we're ready courthouse my eye and your pockets hanging down with gold and silver mean bloody scut stand us a drink itself devil a sweet fear there's a jew for you all for number one cute as a shithouse rat hundred to five don't tell anyone says a citizen beg your pardon says he 
Come on, boys, says Martin, seeing it was looking blue. Come along now. Don't tell anyone, says the citizen, letting a ball out of him. It's a secret. And the bloody dog woke up and let a growl. Bye bye all, says Martin. And he got them out as quick as he could, Jack Power and Crofton, or whatever you call them, and in the middle of them letting on to be all at sea and up with them on the bloody jaunting car. Off with you, says Martin to the Jarvey. The milk-white dolphin tossed his mane and, rising in the golden poop, the helmsman spread the bellying sail upon the wind and stood off forward with all sail set, the spinnaker to larboard. And many comely nips drew nigh to starboard and larboard and, clinging to the sides of the noble bark, they linked their shining forms as doth the cunning wheelwright when he fashions about the heart of his wheel, the equidistant rays whereof each one is sister to another, and he binds them all with an outer ring, and giveth speed to the feel of men whereas they ride to a hosting or contend for the smile of ladies fair. Even so, did they come and set them, those willing nymphs, the undying sisters? And they laughed, sporting in a circle of their own foam. And the bark clave the waves. But, be gob, I was just lowering the heel of the pint when I saw the citizen getting up to waddle to the door, puffing and blowing with the dropsy, and he cursed the curse of Cromwell on him, bell, book, and candle in Irish, spitting and spatting out of him, and Joe and little laugh round him like a leprechaun, trying to peaceify him. "'Let me alone,' says he. And he got, he got as far as the door, and they were holding him, and he bawled out of him. Three cheers for Israel! Arrah! Sit down on the parliamentary side of your arse, for Christ's sake, and don't be making a public exhibition of yourself. Jesus, there's always some bloody clown or other kicking up a bloody murder about bloody nothing. God would turn the paws of sour in your guts, so it would. And all the ragamuffins and sluts of the nation round the door, and Martin telling the Jarvey to drive ahead, and the citizen bawling, and Alf and Joe at him to whist, and he on his high horse about the Jews, and the loafers calling for a speech, and Jack Power trying to get him to sit down on the car and hold his bloody jaw with a loafer, with a patch over his eye, start singing, If the man in the moon was a Jew, 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 and a slut shouts out of her. Oh, mister, your fly is open, mister. And says he, Mendelssohn was a Jew, and Karl Marx, and Mercadante, and Spinoza, and the Saviour was a Jew, and his father was a Jew. Your God. He had no father, says Martin. That'll do now. Drive head. "'Who's God?' says the citizen. "'Well, his uncle was a Jew,' says he. "'Your God was a Jew. Christ was a Jew like me.' "'Gob!' the citizen made a plunge back into the shop. "'By Jesus,' he said, "'I'll brain that bloody Jewman for using the holy name.' "'By Jesus, I'll crucify him, so I will. "'Give us that biscuit box here.' "'Stop!' Stop, says Joe. A large and appreciative gathering of friends and acquaintances from the metropolis and Great Dublin assembled in the thousands to bid farewell to Nagyasosius Urim Lipoti Virag, late of Mrs. Alexander Toms, printed to His Majesty on the occasion of his departure for the distant climb of Sags Harmonius Brutalius Jugulas. Meadow of Murmuring Waters. The ceremony, which went off with great eclat, was characterized by the most affecting cordiality. An illuminated scroll of ancient Irish vellum, the work of Irish artists, was presented to the distinguished phenomenolo phenomenologist on behalf of a large section of the community and was accompanied by the gift of a silver casket 
tastefully executed in the style of ancient Celtic ornament, a work which reflects every credit on the makers, Messrs. Jacob Agus Jacob. The departing guest was the recipient of a hearty ovation, many of those who were present being visibly moved when the select orchestra of Irish pipes struck up the well-known strains of Come Back to Erin, followed immediately by Rakowski's March. Tar barrels and bonfires were lighted along the coastlines of the Far Seas on the summits of Hill of House, Three Rock Mountain, Sugarloaf, Brayhild, the Mountains of Morn, the Galtees, the Oaks and Donegal and Sparren Peaks, the Nagels and the Bogros, the Connemara Hills, the Reeks of Mikkilgudi, Sleevorty, Sleeve Bernag and Sleeve Bloom. Amid cheers that we rent the welkin, responded to by answering cheers from a big muster of henchmen on the distant Cambrian and Caledonian hills, the mastodontic pleasure ship slowly moved away, saluted by a final floral tribute from the re representatives of the fair sex who were present in large numbers while, as it proceeded down the river, escorted by a flotilla of barges, the flags of the ballast office and the custom house were dipped in salute, as were also those of the electrical power station at the pigeon house and the Poolberg light. Vizod Lazzara, Kedves Baraton, Vizod Lazzara, gone but not forgotten. Gob. The devil wouldn't stop him till he got hold of the bloody tin, anyhow, and out with him, and little Alf hanging on to his elbow, and he shouting like a stuck pig, as good as any bloody play in the Queen's Royal Theatre. Where is he till I murder him? And Ned and J.J. paralysed with laughing. Bloody wars, says I, I'll be in for the last gospel. But as luck would have it, the Jarvey got the nag's head, round the other way, and off with him. Hold on, citizen, says Joe, stop! Begorby drew his hand and made a swipe and let fly. Mercy of God, the sun was in his eyes or he'd have left him for dead. Gobby never sent it into the country long county Longford. The bloody nag took fright, and the old mongrel after the car like bloody hell, and all the populace shouting and laughing, and the old tin box clattering along the street. The catastrophe was terrific and instantaneous in its effect. The observatory of Dunsink registered in all eleven shocks all of the fifth grade of Macaulay's scale, and there is no record extent of a similar seismic disturbance in our islands since the earthquake of 1534, the year of the rebellion of Silken Thomas. The epicenter appears to have been that part of the metropolis which constitutes the Inns Quay Ward and the parish of St. Michan, covering a surface of 41 acres, two roods, and one square pole or perch. All the lordly residences in the vicinity of the Palace of Justice were demolished, and that noble edifice itself, in which at the time of the catastrophe important legal debates were in progress, is literally a mass of ruins beneath which it is feared all the occupants have been buried alive. From the reports of eyewitnesses, it transpires that the seismic waves were accompanied by a violent atmospheric perturbation of cyclonic character. An article of headgear since ascertained to belong to the much-respected Clerk of the Crown and Peace, Mr. George Fortrell, and a silk umbrella with gold handle, with the engraved initials, crest, coat of arms, and house number of the erudite and worshipful cat chairman of quarter sessions, Sir Frederick Falconer, recorder of Dublin, have been discovered by search parties in remote parts of the island, respectively the former on the third basaltic ridge of the Giant's Causeway, the latter embedded to the extent of one foot three inches in the sandy beach of Holes, Holes Open Bay near the old head of Kinsale.
Other eyewitnesses deposed that they observed an incandescent object of enormous proportions hurtling through the atmosphere at a terrifying velocity in a trajectory directed southwest by west. Messages of condolence and sympathy are being hourly received from all parts of the different continents, and the sovereign pontiff has been graciously pleased to decree that a special Misa pro defunctis shall be celebrated simultaneously by the ordinaries of each and every cathedral church of all the episcopal dioceses, subject to the spiritual authority of the Holy See in suffrage of the souls of those faithful departed, who have been so unexpectedly called away from our midst. The work of salvage, removal of debris, human remains, etc., had been entrusted to Messrs. Michael Mead and Son, 159 Great Brunswick Street, and Messrs. T. and C. Martin, 77, 78, 79, and 80 North Wall, assisted by the men and officers of the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry, under the general supervision of H.R.H., Rear Admirable, the Right Honourable Sir Hercules Hannibal Habeas Corpus Anderson, K. G. K. P. K. T. P. C. K. C. B. M. P. J. P. M. B. D. S. O. S. O. D. M. F. H. M. R. I. A. B. L. Muse Duck. P. L. G. F. T. C. D. F. R. U. I. F. R. C. P. I. and F. R. C. S. I. You never saw the like of it in all your born puff. Gob, if he got that lottery ticket on the side of his pole, he'd remember the gold cop. He would so, but be gold the citizen would have been lagged for assault and battery, and Joe for aiding and abetting. The Jarvey saved his life by furious driving, as sure as God made Moses. What? Oh, Jesus, he did. And he let a volley of others after him. Did I kill him, says he, or what? And he, shouting to the bloody dog, After him, Gary! After him, boy! And the last we saw, the bloody car rounding the corner, an old sheep's face on it, gesticulating, and the bloody mongrel after it, with its lugs back, for all he was bloody well worth to tear from limb to limb. Hundred to five! Jesus! He took the value out of it, I promise you! When, lo, there came about them all a great brightness, and they beheld the chariot, wherein he stood ascend to, to heaven. And they beheld him in the chariot, clothed upon the glory of the brightness, having raiment as, the, as of the sun, fair as the moon, and terrible, that for all they durst not look upon him. And there came a voice out of heaven, calling, Elijah, Elijah! And he answered with a main cry, Abba, Adonai. And they beheld him, even him, Ben Bloom Elijah, amid clouds of angels, ascended to the glory of the brightness at an angle of forty five degrees over Donahoe's in Little Glean Street, like a shot off a shovel. End of chapter twelve.